Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode was especially exciting for us. We love the book Algorithms to Live By and really wanted Brian's thoughts on how some of his ideas could apply to really big picture career choice considerations and questions. It's uh, likely to be both interesting and useful, I expect, to almost all of you listeners out there. Because we really wanted to get answers we could recommend to everyone in our articles on the explore uh, and exploit trade-off, the conversation kind of just continues to dig deeper and deeper into that problem between an hour and 40 minutes and two hours and 20 minutes. So if you ever feel like you've actually just had enough of that topic, uh, feel free to skip on to the final section, which is a buffet of the most interesting bits I found in the book, starting around two hours and 19 minutes. I also have a really important favor to ask this week. Once a year, in November, 80,000 Hours tries to figure out whether all of the things we've been working on have actually been useful to you or not. This year, we've published now around 66 hours of the podcast, uh, several dozen articles, and hundreds of high-impact jobs that we'd like to see filled on our job board. Our donors need to know whether we've been actually changing people's careers so they can know whether it's a good idea to keep funding us or not. And we need to know that we shouldn't just give up and get different, more useful jobs. If no one had told us their stories through our impact survey in the past, then unfortunately 80,000 hours just wouldn't exist today. So if anything that we've done, including this podcast, our website and articles, or our coaching has changed your career plans or otherwise helped you out, please go to 80,000hours.org slash survey and take a few minutes to let us know how. You can also let us know any ways we've led you astray or could be doing better. It's really useful for us to know which of the services that we provide are most useful and which ones we could fairly safely drop. So that's 80,000hours.org slash survey. All right, here's Brian. Today, I'm speaking with Brian Christian. Brian is a non-fiction author, best known for The Most Human Human and Algorithms to Live By, which he co-authored with Tom Griffiths and which became a number one US bestseller in the non-fiction category. He studied computer science and philosophy at Brown University, and since 2012, has been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley. Since 2013, he's been the director of technology at McSweeney's Publishing and an open source contributor to projects like Ruby on Rails. He's appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Brian. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, I expect to mostly talk about Algorithms to Live By, which is a really outstanding book that a lot of listeners should go out and uh, read after this, uh, after they listen to this episode. And the uh, primary reason uh, is that we have a lot of questions about how to apply some of the algorithms uh, to real life decisions, especially career decisions. And for that purpose, I'm joined today uh, by Ben Todd, founder and CEO of 80,000 Hours, who uh, was especially keen to have this interview because he uh, has some very pressing questions about the <laughs> explore exploit trade off. So welcome, Ben. Yeah, I'm really excited about this interview. Uh, over the last year, this was one of my favorite books, and it really felt like it introduced me to a lot of new mental models that I feel like I should have been taught in school, but wasn't. And uh, in particular, really excited to talk about how it can apply to specific career decisions. Yeah, also the book covered a lot of things that I'd like vaguely heard about before, such as uh, the secretary problem, but it went into way more depth than it's normally covered, but still remaining like really clear, uh, really, really easy to understand. So I found it really interesting. Great. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but first, though, Brian, uh, what are you working on now? Uh, I'm working on a new book right now, which is about normative issues in computer science. So the question of how do we try to capture human values in, for example, machine learning? And so this covers things like, for example, the fairness, accountability, and transparency movement within the ML community, and also things like the value alignment problem uh, that people are thinking about in AI safety. So I think it touches on a number of things probably of interest to uh, 80,000 hours uh, listeners and be excited to talk more about that next year. Uh, what's that book called and when it's coming out? The title is currently wobbling between a few different possibilities. So I, I don't want to say that. until we, until we show, yeah. finally, <laughs> finally determine it. Um, but this will be out. My best guess would be sometime in the fall of next year. Um, yeah. What made you choose to write uh, about that topic? I think partly we are seeing kind of the confluence of I think two major trends. One is just this kind of explosive progress in machine learning as a discipline, you know, particularly with the rise of deep learning starting from 2012 to the present. And that has in turn created this reaction of, you know, bo both jubilation and also concern that has really uh, launched, I think, this subfield unto itself of, of technical AI safety. And you have things like Nick Bostrom's book, obviously, turning into what I think is this really remarkable technical research agenda. And so I'm really interested in 
how some of these big ideas are actually getting cashed out in terms of, you know, PhD theses and so forth. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you've got this societal uh, adoption of machine learning systems increasingly into kind of morally and ethically relevant domains. Driving being one obvious example, but also things like arraignments and sentencing. And so increasingly, we are thinking about how to translate the social contract into explicitly algorithmic terms. And so that is very intriguing to me as being an area where kind of philosophy and computer science are on this collision course. And I think that's only going to be a, a more pressing issue in the next few years. So that, that has really captured my attention. Your first book, uh, The Most Human Human, was also about uh, artificial intelligence. And that was, yeah. I think, back in 2011. What did you write about there? Yeah. Um, so The Most Human Human is about the Turing test. And in particular, my experience as a what's called a human confederate in the uh, Turing test competition. So I was one of these people hidden behind a curtain trying to convince a panel of scientists that I was, in fact, a human being and not a chatbot claiming to be a human being. And this was kind of a fascinating and bizarre experience for me and uh, led me on an investigation both into the history of uh, the Turing test, uh, the history of chatbot technology, and also into just this broader linguistic question of what should you do if you are in this competitive scenario where your objective is to convince someone else that you are a human being? How does that manifest into actual linguistic strategies? And so I had a lot of fun researching that and learning about both the technology and also kind of the nature of human conversation. Yeah, what did you, what did you do, broadly speaking, <laughs> to try to seem like an incredibly human? <laughs> well, I looked into the way that most chatbots of, of the time were, were being made. And, you know, it's funny, the, the book was published in 2011, which was before Siri. So it feels like, you know, another, another time, another age. One of the main strategies that chatbot developers were using, and this is still true in some ways today, is that they would essentially be sampling shards of conversation out of some huge corpus of uh, previous human conversations. So, for example, uh, you could just download, you know, the entire chat transcripts of some message board and then map some user input to, you know, find find the place match. in that archive that's the nearest match and then say the next thing that a real person said in that mm. situation. And systems built this way are at times uncannily impressive. You know, so in the book, I detail my interactions with one program called Cleverbot, where I said, you know, what's two plus two? It says four. I say, what's the capital of France? It says Paris. I say, what's the capital of Romania? It says, uh, Budapest? I don't know. Um, which in some ways is even more impressive because the correct answer is Bucharest. And so this is like an example of graceful degradation and <laughs> kind of like, uh, sort of a meta level analysis of its own uncertainty, which is like extremely impressive from a machine learning context. But the problem is that in a real human conversation, you are not only getting locally appropriate answers to each particular question, but you are building a model of the other person. You're building a conversational history that's then going to influence the things that happen later. And so, uh, for example, if you interact with these programs and you say, you know, are you married? They would say, yes, I'm happily married. If you say, do you want to go out on a date? Then say, sure, I'm, I'm free on Friday. <laughs> They'll sometimes say the word color with the British U, sometimes with the American spelling. And so you, the real tell is not, it, it's not the sense that you aren't interacting with a human. It's that you sense that you aren't interacting with a human. Yeah. Um, it has no memory. Exactly. Yeah. And no long-term coherence. And so one element of my strategy, for example, was to go out of my way to very self-consciously tie all of my answers together into this broader narrative of who I was. Mm -hmm. So if they said, you know, nice weather, huh? Well, the Turing test took place in Britain, so it was actually really bad weather at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying, yeah, this is pretty crappy, but I'm from Seattle, so that's par for the course. Mm -hmm. And later when we were talking about music, I would reference the grunge scene or something like that. Mm -hmm. And just like very explicitly flagging, I'm the same guy who answered that other question. So things like that that I could do to kind of increase the long-term complexity of the interaction, I felt like put, put, the, put the truth on my side. Uh, you mentioned that it's a, kind of a different era in chatbots now. Yeah. Uh, what's what's changed since 2010 or 2011? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think one of the most fascinating things about Turing test from a contemporary perspective is it is it has essentially become woven into the fabric of everyday life. You know, you get an email from someone that, you know, says, 
here are some exciting discounts on Viagra. You know, you're not going to reply to your friend and say, you might want to check with your doctor before you're <laughs> using that. You might uh, rather say, you better reset your password or something like this. And so in a way, communication in the 21st century is effectively a Turing test. And when you send a link to your friend, you now have to sort of performatively put in two or three sentences so they know it's really you and not just some automated message. And I think really the, the climax of this is the 2016 election, where now in hindsight, we're looking back and saying there was a huge amount of kind of automated, insincere activity happening in social media, and people couldn't tell the difference. And so in some ways, that first book of mine, I now think about it from the perspective of like the citizenry of a democracy in the 21st century needs training in order to, you know, navigate online discourse. And I think it's interesting to think about the idea that if social media discourse were at a higher level, you know, or higher bandwidth or more thoughtful or more articulate, then the ruse wouldn't have worked nearly as well. Um, that I think it's it's partly an indictment of just the, the, the poverty of the actual medium and, and the way that language is used. And mm -hmm. so... You know, poets have always been interested in like using the language as articulately and uniquely and expressively as possible. But I think increasingly, this is also a question of national security, um, which to me is, you know, scary, but fascinating. Do you think that's a losing battle trying to detect people who aren't real on, on Twitter or Facebook? Because I guess on the one hand, the, the bots will be getting more and more sophisticated, but then also the technology for detecting them will also get more sophisticated. But, but I suppose at some point, just the bots become, surely they would approach humanity almost exactly, and then you just can't tell the difference. Yeah, I, as I understand it, there's something of an open question just in the theoretical community, people that look at, you know, GANs and adversarial examples and so forth. Will we find that, you know, the, the long-term fixed point is advantage to the attacker or advantage to the defender? I've heard arguments from people I respect on both sides of that, and my conclusion is we don't really know. So, yeah, I think long-term it's a bit concerning. Short-term, I do think there are relatively simple things that one can do. I mean, even just speaking or tweeting or writing in complete sentences rather than in sort of broken sentences makes it easier to find out that someone's not a native English speaker who's claiming to be. So there are these little things that we can do to kind of raise the level of discourse. Longer term, I don't know. It's a little bit spookier. Uh, it seems like oh, Twitter hasn't been trying that hard to get rid of these bots. So they could probably make quite a lot of progress if they just put some effort in and, and actually were willing to, to, to block them. I think they've, they've started doing it now under a lot of, uh, under a lot of heat. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. I mean, the way that one has verified accounts for celebrities or something, you know, you could imagine some sort of Turing test required to get some badge on your account or something like this. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think there was some discussion of them having verified it and like you'd have to send in like a scan of your passport to, to get an account, uh, which people hated because that would prevent anonymous like whistleblowing by Twitter and things like that. Right. Uh, but I guess yeah, the Turing test would, uh, uh, or, yeah, having a conversation that proves that you're a coherent person would would work as well. Although I guess you could have one person just doing that again and again and again for many accounts. It's tricky. That is true. Although at least, <laughs> at least you would limit them to, mm. you know, the <laughs> throughput of one guy working all the time. But I, you know, I've seen this even just um, in online gaming. Like I've, I've had the experience personally of being on some, you know, first person shooter game server and an admin shows up and literally, it, you know, forces you to just make small talk with them. And if you don't, then they <laughs> kick you out. And so, you know, we are, we're starting to enter this uncanny valley where, yeah, again, the Turing test. I think, I think what would shock Alan Turing perhaps the most if you were in the 21st century is that this had become a sort of banal nuisance. You know, it's, it's no longer a thought experiment. It is just this annoying thing that we have yeah. to do time and time again in the course of a day. Uh, so hopefully we get to talk about uh, machine learning again next year when your next book comes out. Um, let's talk about Algorithms to Live By for now. What is that book about in broad strokes? The basic idea is there's a set of problems that all of us face in everyday life, whether it's finding a place to live or deciding whether to commit to a partner or deciding where to go out for dinner or how to rearrange your messy office or how to schedule your time. And, you know, the, these often emerge as the function of uh, limited time, limited information. And we tend to think of them as kind of uniquely and innately human problems. And the message of the book is simply they're not. In fact, they correspond really precisely in some cases to some of the fundamental problems of computer science. And so I think this gives us an opportunity, having made that identification of the sort of underlying computational structure of, of human life, uh, to really learn something by studying the nature of those problems and their you know, uh, optimal solutions. I think that gives us payouts, I would say, at maybe three different scales. You know, at, at one level, 
computer science can in some cases give you just very explicit advice. You know, do this, it will succeed this amount of the time. In other cases, the, you know, a parallel may hold more loosely, but it still gives you an understanding of the structure of the problem, uh, the structure of what optimal solutions look like, and a vocabulary for kind of understanding the parameters of that space. And I think most broadly, it's a way to think about the nature of human rationality itself, that the problems that the world poses to us are computational in nature. And this makes computers not only our tools, but in some sense, our comrades. We are confronting a lot of the same issues. And computer science paints, I think, a very different picture of what rational decision making looks like than you might find in, say, behavioral economics. Because one of the first things that any computer scientist takes into account is the computational complexity. And so once you incorporate the cost of thought itself, I think you end up with a picture of rational decision making, particularly in some of the hardest classes of problems, that looks a lot more familiar and a lot more human. And so I think it's it's a more approachable and a more recognizable version of, or vision, I should say, of, of what human rationality should be. How much do you think people can gain from understanding uh, these issues in, in their day-to-day -day life? Like, do you think it's uh, really important that people know these different models and try to apply them? I think so. I mean, I, I think perhaps the average person doesn't need to go personally into the, you know, wading into the technical literature and, and, you know, looking at specific theorems and so forth. But I think that having a basic vocabulary for, oh, I'm in an optimal stopping problem. Oh, I'm in an explore-exploit trade-off is very useful because these things come up all the time. And I think, um, you know, we can, we can get into in the course of our conversation, you know, what some of the psychological studies show us about what people do by default. In many cases, people's defaults are reasonable. But I think understanding a little bit about the types of problems that we face and being able to recognize and identify when you're in that situation is a really good first step. And for me, having that vocabulary has been really invaluable, you know, that there, there's a a set of concepts that map to these things and just literally having access to those words, I think it's been really useful. What do you think is most fun about the book? Gosh, I, I think there's a lot of things for me that are really fun. I mean, one, one thing that was really fun about writing it and researching it was getting to interview all of these different experts. The book covers a sufficiently wide swath of terrain over computer science, operations research, psychology, cognitive science. There's really no one person that's an expert in all those things. And so my co-author Tom and I went on sort of an expedition to try to find the people in each of these domains that were the most well-informed, the most expert in each case. And it was really fun, A, getting to hear the stories behind how they discovered some of these different breakthroughs, and also getting to put the question to them of whether their research has impacted their own life and the way they think about things um, day to day. And I would say maybe 50% of people said, oh, you know, that's really interesting. I've never thought about that. And the other 50% said, oh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> no question. And so, yeah, it was, it was really satisfying just getting to hear those stories. One interesting thing is a lot of the original contributors are still alive because a lot of this was That's discovered right. quite recently. That's right. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I, I guess the original generation of founders of computer science, you know, von Neumann and Turing, um, none of them are still around. But I would say the generation after that, a lot of those guys are still alive and it's really incredible, you know, so... We interviewed uh, Tony Hoare, who is the inventor or discoverer of Quicksort. And, you know, we asked him, how did you come up with Quicksort? You know, this, this incredible algorithm. And he was like, well, I just thought, how would I sort something? And that was the first idea that came to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's really incredible to look back on a time when the discipline was so young that you could make this career-defining discovery just by being like, Hmm, how should I sort something? Let's try this. <laughs> okay, hey, it works. Wasn't that how like Gauss came up with how to sum a geometric series or something when he was a school kid? I don't know. <laughs> In some ways, I think, yeah, one, one feels envious for, you know, just the, the low hanging fruit that mm. was around, you know, at that period of time. Perhaps not envious of the lifestyle they had given the <laughs> discoveries that they hadn't made, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, and now there's this is partly why this is so interesting because i think because these many of these ideas have been discovered so recently they haven't made it into our general consciousness where 
maybe say the heuristics and biases literature that's um, become pretty mm. well known recently with like thinking fast and slow just in the last decade or so. But this is another wave of research on human decision making that I think is way less widely known than that, and even maybe more important in some cases. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, part of our mission, I think, in the book, to some degree, was to try to speed that process up or, or help it along. You know, so one case was in the context of the explore exploit trade off, there are a set of ideas that have emerged in computer science that have become really interesting to people who think about medical ethics. Um, so we can, we can get deeper into that question later. But watching the FDA start to come to an understanding of like, oh, wow, computer scientists have had this best practice for like 40 years. It seems relevant to this domain in which human lives are on the line. Maybe we ought to think about evaluating some of those ideas and, and importing them into, say, clinical trials. And so that was an area where I hadn't expected to, in a way, put on an activist hat and really feel like, okay, I can use this book to try to actually nudge that adoption process forward and say, like, yeah, you really should look into this. One of my favorite blog posts ever uh, looks into this question of why is it that so many of the intellectual greats seem to have been from hundreds or thousands of years ago rather than today, even mm. despite the fact that there's so many more um, people around today and so many more academics, so many more researchers. And there's, like, lots of potential reasons for that. Uh, but probably the key one is that the, there was much more low-hanging fruit 2,500 years ago. You could yeah. make enormous philosophical breakthroughs just by clarifying the most ordinary concepts, <laughs> uh, actually yeah, so sitting down and doing that. Whereas yeah. today, you have to yeah, spend 30 years training to get to the frontier and then yeah, yeah, and right. find some like slightly new yeah, new idea that someone hasn't else hasn't had. All right. Uh, so just to signpost where we're going, I think uh, mostly we're going to talk about three different models, that, which each have uh, three different chapters in the book. One is explore versus exploit. The next one is optimal stopping. And the third one is introducing randomness or simulated annealing. And each of them, they're, they're related in different ways. Uh, they're all about uh, trade-offs that you have between um, trying out different things and gaining information versus choosing the best uh, that you've found so far. And they, they can seem to blur into one another, but we're going to explain later, I guess, to try to uh, give clear criteria for which one you'd want to use in different cases. And I think the cases that we should keep in mind as we're going through would be things like choosing which profession to go into as you, uh, you know, advance in your career you know, from undergrad to, to early jobs to uh, mid-career. Thinking about what specific jobs to accept when you're on, on, on a job search at a specific moment. Uh, perhaps deciding what city you're eventually going to spend the rest of your life in or, you know, who to date and whether to get married and things like that. Are there any other, yeah, archetypal cases that you think people should have in mind as they're thinking about these models? I think, you know, some of that we may just bring up in the course of it. I mean, optimal stopping is uh, famously applicable to being in a car where uh, it's generally difficult to turn around. So yeah, part of what's interesting is there are literal physical embodiments of some of these concepts. There are also kind of conceptual embodiments. But I think, yeah, well, it may be easier to draw that out in the context of Let's the actual... Them. Yeah. Also, in our 80,000 Hours Career Guide, we cover a lot of um, key questions that people face in their careers, such as like which problems to focus on, uh, like, should you invest in yourself and gain more skills or try to have an impact right away? And one of the really big questions of a career decision is basically how much to explore versus just go with your best guess. And so a big decision you can have in mind is like, you know, should I go down one path, become an academic, or should I like try and work in government or should I work in nonprofits? And that's the key question we're addressing. And I think there's a lot that many of these models might be able to say about that question. And we're going to kind of basically try and attack it from a bunch of different angles. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that this question of whether people should explore more or whether they already explore too much is an uncertainty we've had since the beginning. Uh, we're fairly mm. confident that people don't consider enough options. They don't put, mm. put enough options down on the page uh, when they're just considering what could I possibly do in my life. But then whether they do too many internships or too few internships, you know, between the ages of 18 and 25 is, is, is a bit harder to say. And like if you're working on a job and it's like doesn't work out, how quickly should you switch versus mm. like pushing on? Yeah, should you like try several jobs or just find the thing you think is best and go pretty hard into that? All right, explore, exploit. Um, <laughs> what's the what's the classic explore, exploit dilemma? So, so yeah. set, set the scene here, uh, Brian. Right, right. So, well, uh, first I'll make a linguistic note, which is in the explore, exploit trade-off, um, this is the, the tension between uh, spending your time and energy, you know, trying new things, gathering information versus spending your time and energy leveraging the information that you already have to get, uh, you know, a pretty safe, good outcome. And so 
In English, we've stacked the deck linguistically towards exploration because we think of exploitation as uh, kind of pejorative. But we have to think about these from the perspective of computer science and, and treat them as value neutral terms. So the, the canonical explore exploit problem in computer science is what is called the multi arm bandit problem. So the basic idea is you walk into a casino, there are you know, N slot machines, some huge number of slot machines, and you're going to be in the casino for a while, let's say an afternoon. And this is a bit of a strange casino because some of the machines pay off with different probabilities than others. Um, but you don't know in advance, of course, which are which. And so the problem is quite simply, how do you make as much money as possible over the period of time that you're going to be there? So intuitively, we might imagine there's some combination of exploring, that is trying different machines out, seeing which ones appear to be giving you higher payoffs on average than others, and exploiting, which is, you know, biasing yourself towards, of course, cranking the handle of the machines that do, in fact, seem the most promising. But exactly what that balance should be and exactly what our strategy ought to be in that situation has this wonderful and colorful history in the field where for most of the 20th century, it was considered an unsolvable problem uh, and, you know, career suicide. And in fact, the Allied, the British mathematicians during World War II joked about dropping the multi arm bandit problem over Germany <laughs> as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage, just waste the brain power of the Germans. So, uh, yeah, when was this question first specified? It's a good question. I think William Thompson was uh, looking at a version of the multi arm bandit problem in the 1930s. That literature ended up getting kind of buried and wasn't rediscovered until much later. It came up again in the early 1950s, and it had this reputation for, as I said, being this kind of brain teaser, but not being an actual thing that you could work on. The first uh, paper on it came in, I think, 1952 by Herbert Robbins, where he was talking about a strategy that he came up with called Wednesday Lose Shift, which just means if you pull the slot machine handle and it just paid out, pull it again. If it didn't, try something else. And he was able to prove that that strategy is better than pulling all of the handles at random, uh, which is like such a modest <laughs> result. Um, you know, here's an algorithm that's better than chance. That, that was as much as could be said at the time. But in some <coughs> ways, that was kind of that first handhold on the problem of maybe we can actually start to getting somewhere on this. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it was then um, Bellman who yep. came up with a theoretically uh, correct answer to this question, but it was not really computable. It was just too difficult to ever actually figure out what, what it was, even if you had the formula. That's right. So Bellman in 1957 uh, comes up with his famous idea of dynamic programming, which involves kind of working backwards from the end and saving or memoizing different solutions of these possible endings and then using them to work your way backwards towards where you are now, which is quite ingenious and you know is this incredibly important technique even today. But in the context of the multi-arm bandit problem, it relies on a few assumptions that make it not really ideal in practice. So it does require a lot of computing. Um, it requires that you know in advance exactly how many machines there are, how many times you are going to pull uh, the handle total, Things that may not be realistic or may not be useful in like a practical real world situation. And so there, it's a funny history because in some sense you get the definitive solution to the problem in 1957. On the other hand, it leaves open, you know, it's sort of unsatisfying for all these different reasons. So we got the, the first really practical solution uh, from Gittins, I think, in the 70s or 80s. Is That's that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to describe yeah, his, his approach? Yeah. So there's this lovely story. I mean, I think one of the things that I just love about the history of mathematics in general is sometimes people think they're solving a very specific problem. And what they come up with has this level of generality that they don't even anticipate. So John Gittins in the 1970s, he's now a math professor at Oxford. Uh, at the time, he was doing some consulting for the Unilever Corporation. And they wanted to know basically how to allocate their money across different projects. So you have, you know, pure research and development of, of new drugs. You also have marketing of profitable drugs. How much of our budget should we spend on one? How much on the other? And Gittins immediately recognizes this as being kind of like a multi arm bandit problem, where you have these different levers you can pull. You don't know in advance how well they'll pay out. And there's a particular twist here, which I think is quite fascinating. So Gittins is thinking about this from the perspective of the Unilever Corporation, which wants to exist theoretically forever. 
They are not interested in maximizing their revenue over any particular time period, but indefinitely. At the same time, it's better to have that money now than later. And so he approached the problem saying, well, instead of there being some finite sequence of rewards, what if there's an infinite sequence of geometrically discounted rewards? So if, you know, a dollar tomorrow is worth as much as 99 cents today, and, you know, that extends all the way into the future, is there a way that we can think about the problem in, in this context? And it, it was really fascinating thinking about how he approached the problem because he sort of sighed and thought, well, unfortunately, we all know that the multi-armed bandit problem is unsolvable. But let me at least think about what would give me a good approximate answer. Um, and he comes up with this strategy that we now know as the Gittins Index, which basically says, for each machine, imagine a, a guaranteed payout so good that you would never play that machine even one more time. For every machine, there is some price that you would rather just take that reward again and again and again than even try the machine once. Try another machine once. Yeah. A different machine. Yeah. yeah. And he called this the dynamic allocation index. We now know it as the Gittins index. And his thought was, well, you could just calculate that independently for each machine. It wouldn't depend on which other machines existed. And, you know, you could just play the machine with the highest Gittins index. And he thought, well, this would, this might be a reasonable approximation to the problem. And then to his own surprise, this is the solution to the problem. And so I, I think that's this wonderful story again of just these mathematicians following their instincts and saying kind of humbly, well, here's an idea. Let's try it. And it turned out to be the answer. And so this is another case where the Gittins index is the kind of gold standard for dealing with the multi arm bandit problem with infinite discounted rewards, geometrically discounted rewards. And yet there are still reasons that we may not want to use it in practice. So for one, it relies, like I said, on geometric discounting, which there are a number of studies that suggest humans don't do, although perhaps they should. So if you're doing hyperbolic discounting, then you're in a different paradigm. Um, it deals with this idea of infinite rewards, which may or may not be applicable to a particular situation. And lastly, it's just non-trivial to compute the Gittins index for every given machine. And it's hard to do it in real time. Um, yeah, so there's an awesome table in your book. But <laughs> yes. As you point out, if you're like at a restaurant and you get that out and try to <laughs> say, well, we've had seven good meals here so far and two bad ones. Now, should we switch to another restaurant next time? Right, yeah, exactly. Your friends have probably stopped listening long before that point. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so, you know, we, we encourage you to cut out this table and, you know, carry it in, in your wallet. Um, but, of course, you and your friends also have to agree on the discounting function. That you're using. <laughs> yeah. So, maybe, yeah, what's, what are some more um, more rules of thumb solutions to the multi bandit problem that someone might be able to kind of bear in mind in a sure. real situation? I think there are a few kind of big picture ideas here. So... One of the key ideas, as I see it, is if you're dealing with the finite horizon case, then one of the things you see by looking at the exact solutions that dynamic programming offers you is that you should basically front load your exploration and do the bulk of your exploitation at the end. And this makes sense, I think, for three different reasons. The first is that the odds that a new machine that you try is better than the best one you already know about can only go down um, as you get more information. An analogy that I like to use is if you have taken a, a work transfer to Spain and you're going to be there for a year, the first restaurant you go out to the very first night you're in Spain is guaranteed to be the best restaurant you've ever been to in Spain. The second restaurant you try has a 50% chance of being the best restaurant that you've ever been to in Spain. Um, and this, of course, goes down um, as a function of your experience. And so the chance that trying a new thing will yield something better than what you already know about can only go down. And what's more, the value of making that discovery can also only go down over time. So if you find an incredible restaurant your last week in Spain, that's strictly worse than finding that restaurant on your first week in Spain. And so both the chance of making a discovery and the value of making that discovery uh, can only go down over time. On the other hand, the value of just doing your favorite thing or going with the best option can only increase over time, again, as a function of your experience. So for all of those reasons, it makes sense to think about ourselves as kind of on this trajectory from exploration to exploitation as a function of kind of where we perceive ourselves to be within this finite horizon. And what I think is really interesting about that idea is that it offers us a way of thinking about kind of the human lifespan 
you know, at, at, at its broadest level. And we're seeing, for example, cognitive scientists and psychologists like, for example, Alison Gottnick at UC Berkeley drawing on the technical literature of the explore-exploit trade-off to make this argument about infant cognition and saying, you know, there's this huge body of evidence that suggests that infants are highly random. They have this huge novelty bias. They always want to look at an unfamiliar object. Uh, no matter how carefully you've chosen their Christmas gift, they're just relentlessly interested in the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it can be tempting to view this as kind of just a failure of willpower or attention span or, or that kids are just this kind of defective version of adults. In fact, you can appeal to the explore exploit trade-off and make this argument that no, these kids have just burst through the doors of life's casino. There are machines everywhere. They're going to be there for 80 years. They really should begin their process by just flailing around, pulling those levers at random, you know, putting every object in the living room in their mouth at least once. <laughs> um, and so we can, we can think about, you know, the, the stigma of child cognition as actually being the optimal strategy given where they are in that finite horizon. So, okay, so as a general principle, we want to explore more early and then move more towards um, committing and using what we already know, um, which we're calling exploit. Can we now get a little bit more quantitative about that? Like, how much should you explore early versus um, switching to exploit? Like, when, in, so suppose you're on a two-week holiday, like, how many days might you, might you explore and then exploit? Yeah, I would love to be able to give you, like, a specific threshold. I feel like it probably depends on how many restaurants there are in that town and exactly what the uh, distribution of their, you know, food quality is that you're drawing from. So, I mean, this is one of the problems with dynamic programming is that we might have to actually crunch the numbers. But I think more broadly, there's this idea that front-loading your exploration strictly, you know, so that for the first X number of nights, you only try new things. And then after some point, you only do the best thing. That's an algorithm that's called Epsilon First. And it turns out that Epsilon First has this particular downside, which is that it offers what's called linear regret. And so this kind of takes us from the 70s to the 80s. And the next big breakthrough in studying the multi armed bandit problem came from Herbert Robbins. Again, uh, 30 years after his initial discovery, he's back. Um, to advance the plot again with um, one of his collaborators. And they were able to frame the multi armed bandit problem in the context of what's called regret minimization. And so in everyday human life, we have this idea that we want to minimize the number of regrets that we have in the future. And in the context of the multi armed bandit problem, that has this kind of beautifully explicit form, which is your regret is all of the money that you left on the table, all of the money that you could have made if only you knew at the beginning everything that you knew by the end. And so uh, Robbins and Lai looked at this question of if you are following the optimal strategy, what's the best you can do with regards to regret? And what they found is that using the optimal strategy, your regret will grow logarithmically. So this is kind of a good news, bad news thing. You know, the bad news is even if you are doing the optimal thing, you will continue to leave more and more money on the table. You'll still be making mistakes. But the frequency and intensity of those mistakes will flatten gradually over time. And so this gave theorists another tool in their toolbox for thinking about how to approach the multi arm bandit problem, which is to say, we know that the best case scenario is that we can have strategies that offer logarithmic regret. What are simpler strategies than, for example, the Gittins index that still offer this really nice property? So earlier we were talking about uh, epsilon first, which is the strategy that you just explore for a fixed period of time and then exploit every, you know, forevermore after that. So the reason that that strategy is linear in its regret is that the amount of exploration you did gives you some fixed chance that you are wrong in identifying the best slot machine or the best restaurant. Mm -hmm. or and, you know, at, at, at the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, there's just a percentage chance that you make the wrong decision forever after that. Um, and so that's your linear regret. And, and so every round, your regret goes up by the difference in the average between the one that you chose to pull forever and the, and the optimal one that you could have chosen to pull. So it just keeps on growing. It just keeps, yeah, every single pull is another like small <laughs> margin of error. <laughs> right. And so there's been a lot of really exciting work starting in the mid 80s and continuing through the 21st century 
of trying to identify simple intuitive strategies that offer this guarantee of logarithmic regret. And yeah, what, uh, what's, what's the, what's the <laughs> yeah, answer? So what are they? <laughs> so what, yeah, what are they? Um, one of them is what's called epsilon decreasing. So if you have a certain fixed chance that you are going to try something random and explore, but that you slowly decrease that percentage according to some kind of schedule, then you can prove that this strategy uh, achieves logarithmic regret. The way the strategy would work is like, um, suppose you have a process which is like 80% of the time I'm going to pull the thing that I think, the pull the lever that I think is best right now. And 20% of the time, which is the epsilon, you're going to just pull a random lever. Yeah. And then you slowly decrease that percentage uh, as you go on. Yeah, that's right. So let's say there may be specific technical results about your cooling schedule in order to achieve that result. We can direct interested readers into the technical literature on that. But the basic intuition is, yeah, if every day, you know, you, you start with some fixed chance of, let's say, 20% that you're going to try something random. But every day that fixed chance goes down, let's say it's multiplied by 0.99 or something mm -hmm. every single day. Then this is the kind of strategy that avoids the pitfalls of epsilon first, because there's always some chance. Now, granted, it'll, it will dwindle, of course, in the long run, but there's always some chance that if you've made a mistake at identifying which is the best machine, you're still leaving the door open a crack to getting new information that could change that. But of course, you are sort of tapering that down in some ways appropriately as you gather more and more information, which makes it less and less likely that you have made a mistake. Mm. So uh, how does that compare with upper confidence bound algorithms, which you spend a fair bit of time on in this chapter? So one of the other strategies that's very simple and intuitive, but also offers this property of logarithmic regret is what's called upper confidence bound. And the basic idea here is that you compute a what's called a one sided confidence interval for each of these machines. So for people with a statistics background, you're used to seeing you know, the, the error bars above and below a quantity, you know, on a bar chart. And so what is interesting about upper confidence bound is it says, we're not actually interested in the expected value of the machine. And we're not interested in the lower bound. We're only interested in the upper bound of how good it could be. And so you just always play the machine with the highest upper bound. And this is an idea which I think elegantly synthesizes exploration and exploitation, because something that you have less information about is going to naturally have wider bounds. And as you learn more and more about it, those bounds are going to tighten. And so I think it's a really sort of beautiful way of synthesizing both the idea that we want to optimize for quality, but we also want to optimize for information and bringing that together into a single idea. And I think it's also, there's just something kind of poetic about the idea that it's, it's essentially the, the rational case for optimism, that you are only interested in the reasonable best case scenario. In some ways, you, you almost don't even care about what you expect will happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's, there's a principle there which I just find kind of encouraging. <laughs> like it's, it's one of these results that you, you feel sort of happy knowing <laughs> that that's the case. And wait, so yeah, if we, if we zoom out a little bit, you can imagine you're about to pull one of the levers and your best guess is that every time you pull the lever, you get um, $10, say. Um, so that's the expected value of the lever. But then you're saying, now you want to think about, say, what's my upper 10% 10 10 confidence interval? So I think maybe there's a 10% chance that I actually will get $15 from this, from this lever if it turns out to be better than my best guess. And then you want to do that for all the levers and go for the one where you think there's your, your kind of 10% level is actually highest rather than what your best guess, where your best guess is highest. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, again, I guess there's a technical literature on whether you should be kind of using like 10% confidence interval or 5th, 5th percent. Or yeah, it, it, the, the paper where they kind of make the proof that this is regret minimizing uses what's called the churnoff hofting bound. So I can give you the exact the exact prescription, which is you want to play the machine that maximizes your expected value plus the square root of two times the natural log of the total number of handles that have been pulled divided by the number of times you've pulled that handle. So the number of handles. <laughs> the number of handles. <laughs> I see why you did not put that in the uh, core of the book. Yeah, some of this stuff ends up buried in the end notes for a reason. But. This is the number of handles you've pulled in the past so far? Yes. Um, yeah, so it's the square root of a fraction, 
the top of the fraction is two times the natural log of the total number of pulls in mm -hmm. the casino divided by the number of pulls of that specific machine. And, and so, that's not the number of arms, it's the number of past pulls that you've done so far. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And so generally that means that the confidence interval is you're using a narrower one over time? Yeah. 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 And so that's Which is again down. the same heuristic we just covered. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is the specific bound that they used for their proof, but I think the intuition is pretty clear. Is yeah, and, and it, it sort of withstands you using, you know, diff different statistical mm -hmm. measures of upper confidence. I mean, I think it's also just an intuitive idea of, you know, when you're in a situation, what is a reasonable best case scenario? Um, you know, if I go out to dinner, the reasonable best case scenario is not that like my dinner companion gives me a million dollars, but it might be that they give me an idea for a book that I then go into. You know, so I think some of these things cash out into more in intuitive notions of, of what the un upper confidence interval would be. But as an idea, I think it's pretty, pretty robust and kind of suggestive across a, a much broader swath. And like thinking about careers again a little bit, the idea just on that intuitive level would be kind of consider the career where it, which might plausibly turn out to be best rather than your, your best guess at which, which one is better. Yeah. And so I'm, if you've got two, which are kind of maybe roughly think they're similar, but one you could see there could be this amazing scenario and the other one doesn't have that amazing scenario thing, then you should probably try out the amazing scenario one first. Yes. And, and is, is the intuition behind this optimism kind of heuristic that one way of seeing why that makes sense is that if you do the optimistic kind of the thing that's plausibly best, but that turns out not to work, uh, then you can just switch to something else. That's but exactly it, right. But if it turns out to work, then you've made this amazing discovery. You've now on this, like you're on this really good path and you can just carry on with that. Uh, so it like pays to be optimistic earlier because it might let you pick out this amazing thing that you would have missed otherwise. That's and exactly right. limited. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah, your your point that the costs of, are limited is, I think, an important subtext here. So, you know, in the classic version of the multi arm bandit problem, the machines either pay out some fixed amount or they pay out zero, um, and so your losses are are bounded. You know, if you're in a world where the machine might explode and kill you, and then you can't <laughs> continue gambling on mm. anything, um, then you probably do want to consider the lower yeah. end of the confidence interval. Mm. Um, so it's it's partly a function of the nature of the canonical multi-arm bandit problem, that if you put a dollar into the machine, your losses are bounded at one dollar. Mm. And it's also one of the assumptions of the problem that you can just effortlessly walk over to the next machine. And so in some ways, the maximum cost for, for trying something and concluding that it was a waste of time is one dollar. And... In reality, of course, uh, it may take you much more than a single metaphorical pull of the lever to determine that a career isn't for you, or it may be more difficult to switch back to what you were doing before after you've left an organization or something. And so there are versions of the multi arm bandit problem that include what are called switching costs mm -hmm. um, that sort of add friction to these things. And we can include some links if people want to go into that literature too. That's one of the variations that people have considered. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I mean, also the issue of um, lower confidence interval might maybe being important is maybe a bit separate because like you say, all you're losing is like the money that you could have gained on that lever. But in a real career decision, you can actually kind of like lose more than you put in. So you go into a job and you turn out to hate it and you get depressed and burn out. And that then you've like, you're actually in a worse position than where you started rather than just getting zero instead of yeah. some positive payoff. You've gone backwards. Or maybe even we're thinking more on a social impact point of view, you can imagine like in some areas, it's easy to make things worse rather than better. Mm, so like right. trying to do policy change, it's very easy to have um, unintended consequences of that. And so you might actually again make this area, the problem you're trying to work on worse rather than better. And yeah, so that was one of our questions. Yeah. Like how would you factor in kind of, you could get negative payouts rather than just zero or one payouts. Yeah, I think that's an important question. I mean, so... I tend to make the reverse argument. So just thinking about an individual employee trying to decide what career is best for them. So one anecdote here is a good friend of mine was an engineer at Google, and he was trying to decide whether to leave Google and uh, start a startup. And his manager said, well, you know, you're on this great trajectory. You're making all this money. Do you really want to try something that will in all likelihood fail? And then, then where will you be? And he said, well, come on, you and I both know that 
if I fail and I come back to you in 18 months time and want to rejoin your team, are you, are you going to say no out of spite? <laughs> and the manager was forced to admit that, no, in fact, he would gladly take him back at his, you know, um, you know, existing salary, if not more and so forth. And so I think that's an example where people can get a little bit spooked and perhaps over, uh, overrate the downside. Um, so stepping away from a job for a year, crashing and burning in the startup game, and then getting right back in where you left off. I think that's really an argument for being willing to, to take that risk. And in fact, I, I counseled my friend literally with the explore exploit, you know, literature and said, you know, I, I think you should really pull that, pull that new lever. And so I think from, from an employee's perspective, it makes sense to be fairly optimistic. I think most people, in my experience, if anything, are not optimistic enough. I think from an organizational perspective, especially if you're doing some kind of major intervention um, that could have some huge unintended consequence, you know, you go into some country and you give everyone free wheat, but then you destroy the local wheat economy or something like this. That's certainly a case where you're you're in something that probably doesn't really resemble the multi-armed bandit problem at that point. You know, yeah. you've unintentionally imploded the casino or something like this. <laughs> um you know, you're probably in something that's closer to an MDP, and there's just that's a whole other kettle of fish. What does that stand for? Uh, that's a Markov decision process. Okay. Um, so an environment where the actions you take change the state that you find yourself in. So one of the nice things about the abstraction of the canonical multi-armed bandit problem is that your actions don't really do anything to the environment. Like you're you get X money or not, but then you're right back where you found yourself in yep. something like a Markov decision process. You know, you you take some action and, you know, if you think about an Atari game as a markup decision process, you use some power up and now you don't have it. So you've changed the set of options that you have or the state that you're in. And so that's that's just an even more complicated uh, domain. So I think identifying, so this goes back to this question of trying to identify the situation that you find yourself in and asking yourself, if this feels more like a multi arm bandit problem, then let me kind of painlessly and cheerfully explore a bit because you know the downside is capped yeah i mean i i totally agree when you're thinking about normal career decisions people maybe don't appreciate that the downside is relatively capped and it's uh okay to explore more than people often do but yeah i think it's when you start to think about some more of these um social impact issues you could imagine like often often dealing with these cases where there could be like either really good upsides or significant downsides if you're like yeah, yeah. pushing through a major a major like policy change or something like that and yeah. it's more like a multi-arm where it could the machine could actually like force you to pay <laughs> right, right. Like you pull it and then it's like nine minus ten now you like owe the machine yeah, money exactly. or it could be like plus 20 or something yeah now i mean the other thing that i think is worth kind of unpacking here is that the other assumption in the multi-arm bandit problem is that you get the feedback immediately um it's not like you pull the handle 10 years later a check comes in the mail yeah it's for 10 cents or whatever and so this is something that may or may not be true in a lot of situations, right? So one of the reasons that tech companies really like uh, multi arm bandit algorithms is for something like ad optimization, you show an ad, the user clicks on it or not, and you've gotten that feedback immediately. So you really can model that as a multi arm bandit problem. The feedback is instantaneous. Um, and so you can really adapt and, uh, and adjust your ad probabilities in, basically in real time. So as some of these ideas I mentioned earlier are making their way into the medical literature, uh, in something like a clinical trial, the first clinical trial to use what's called an adaptive method, which is basically you're changing the percentage of people that are receiving the experimental drug versus the conventional drug in real time, um, rather than waiting until the end of the trial. The first case uh, in the medical literature that used this was for something called ECMO. So this is back in the 1980s, infants that were going into pulmonary arrest and their, their lungs were stopping. Uh, the conventional treatment was really bad. It only worked, I think, something like 60% of the time. And so someone got this idea we want to try this new crazy experimental technique called ECMO. We think it could work considerably better. It could also be a total disaster. It has a risk of embolism and all these things. One of the reasons that just from a formal perspective, it made sense to use some of these multi-arm bandit algorithms was that if someone goes into pulmonary arrest, you either save their life within five minutes or they die within five minutes. And so, you know, obviously that's a, it's a tragic scenario to have to deal with, but in some sense, there's this mathematical silver lining, which is that it makes it much easier to rapidly identify 
whether some new technique is better or worse than the status quo. You don't have to administer it and then track these people longitudinally over the rest of their lives. And so this is another one of these parameters where you can sort of identify, am I getting immediate feedback? If so, then this is more like a multi-armed bandit problem. If I'm not, then I may want to adjust my strategy and, and not mm. rely so heavily on that framework. Okay, so we've covered a couple of different complications. One is that you might sometimes have negative payouts. Now we've just covered you are getting some kind of imperfect information, imperfect feedback. Uh, it might take several years to like really figure out how a certain path unfolded. And you also mentioned just earlier, we've got switching costs. Right. Where in practice, in real life, you can't just switch between the arms. You have to like do a whole job application process, which takes you months. Right. And I mean, yeah, do you have any <laughs> intuitions about how these might affect which strategies are best? I mean, mm. my guess is it's going to generally mean you should do a bit less exploration because the costs of exploring are higher. You're getting less information and you are less able to use the information because you have to switch. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah, the, the intuitive answer is that's exactly right. So the higher the switching cost, the, the more reluctant you should be to abandon an option, even if it seems like it's not working, or the more reluctant you should be to, to try something frivolously because you're going to pay that switching cost twice, once, mm -hmm. once to go in and another time to get out. Another thing, you know, an, another assumption that is kind of underneath this whole conversation is that the quality of the options that we're evaluating is static. The restaurant doesn't fire their chef and get a new guy who's not as good, or the company doesn't kind of lose its way or change their management or, or whatever. And so when the probabilities, the payout probabilities of these different machines can change, then you find yourself in what's called the restless bandit problem, mm -hmm. um, which is NP complete and, you know, there's no effective solution <laughs> that's going to get you there all the time. And for me, there's an interesting footnote here, which is that people actually seem very good at dealing with restless bandit problems in practice. And so here's a case where the computer scientists are, in fact, turning to the cognitive scientists and saying, how are you guys modeling the human decision making process? Because it seems that people have a really good heuristic for dealing with this, like known intractable problem. We'd love to, we'd love to know what it is, because um, that'll give us some insights that we can use in a purely computational context. So if I remember from the book, when you give people multi bandit problems in a lab, they actually explore too much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I found very surprising because normally it seems the general theme in this kind of literature is like people don't really explore enough. They like stick with the status quo. They have sunk cost fallacy. But actually here they should have just carried on pulling the best guess lever, but then they kept switching. I've got major objections to that experiment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah, but great. maybe, maybe set it so, up So yeah, first. let me tee it up. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the canonical experiments in this area was done by Amos Tversky um, in the 1960s. And the basic idea is that you have a box with two different lights on it. And you have an option to press a button and either observe which of these two lights comes on or make a bet on which of the two you thought was going to turn on, but you don't get to observe it. And so you don't know until the end of the study whether your bet paid out or not. And I think these lights... One of them lit up 60% of the time, the other one 40% of the time. And I believe participants were told that, but I, I'm not 100% sure about that. And so the basic idea is, again, how do you maximize your total take, your total earnings over, in this case, a thousand trials? And it turns out that the optimal strategy is observe the first 38 times and then blindly make a series of 962 bets on whichever <laughs> light happened to have come on mm -hmm. more in those first 38. And mm -hmm. then you're done. Is that what human subjects did? No, not even close. Um, people would observe for a while, bet for a while, observe a little bit more again, and bet a little bit more again. And I, th I want to say, on average, people observed 500 times. 505. Yeah. <laughs> 505 Out of 1,000, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this is a case, I mean, my, my read on this is that the participants were told that these probabilities were fixed, but... For me to be a bit more sympathetic or charitable towards the subjects, you know, they knew they were in a psychology experiment. There's a long storied history of being lied to uh, <laughs> by experimenters in psychology studies. And so they didn't necessarily want to take the experimenter's word for it. And so they were effectively acting as if they were in a restless bandit problem where, let's say, the payoff probabilities mm. are on a random walk and go up and down. That's what I was just thinking. Maybe people explore more because they think the probability might be changing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's one way to model the data that they saw was people were establishing a certain level of confidence that enabled them to switch into this betting mode. But as time went by, 
you know, their uncertainty started to grow. And once it hit a certain threshold, they gathered a bit more information. And it makes sense because real life is a restless bandit problem rather than a multi on bandit problem, probably because especially in careers, like the landscape is always changing. So maybe our intuitions have evolved more to deal with that one rather than the more like kind of artificial where everything's stable situation. Yeah. yeah. So this experiment right. is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the issues I think that, oh yeah, they said it's stable, but um, they might not, like even if they believe them, uh, all of their intuitions about how much to explore and how much to exploit um, are based on life where things are changing all the time. So it's impossible mm. for it to get through to their intuitions. Like even if yeah. on like an explicit level, they kind of believe it, but that does explain why they alternate between like uh, exploring and exploiting rather than just like do all explore and then all exploit. But the, even, the much more severe issue is that in this experiment, uh, while you were exploring, you didn't get any benefit. You couldn't drive sure. any benefit from uh, the, the levers that you were pulling, which seems very artificial and not, not like a typical case at all. And if you were able to, to derive the benefit, which is either like 40% or 60%, depending on the lever, that reduces the cost of exploration so much that it wouldn't surprise me if this like 500 out of 1,000 uh, sample wouldn't, uh, where you're exploring, like wouldn't be kind of reasonable. Uh, and again, like people's intuitions are all going to be about cases where while you're exploring, you, you derive benefit. Yeah. Um, and then uh, like yeah. another issue is that they, they made the differences between the levers relatively small. So it's like 40% versus 60% payoff. Like in real life, things like are often more varied than that. And so people's intuitions, again, are like more in favor of, of, of exploration because the, the differences aren't, aren't so limited. Right. I mean, oh, you know, and there's imagine, an, an, another yeah. objection is that, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Uh, is that uh, people maybe just enjoyed the novelty of like trying the levers and exploring uh, rather than just like pulling it and not seeing any response at all. Because in the exploit phase, you don't find out uh, whether you're benefiting. And when, whenever does that happen? When you were, yeah, that's also so artificial. You're so you're exploiting and you don't even find out whether you're winning. That's like very weird. Yes. So I think this whole thing was the deck was completely stacked to produce this like surprising result. Uh, but I don't know that we can learn anything about the real world from the. This, this difference between the theoretical optimal and what people did. Yeah, I think that's all That's all right. I mean, you know, imagine a stock market in which as soon as you buy a stock, you cease to know the value <laughs> of that stock. I mean, it's just very strange. Right. right? There's, yeah. it's, I would be hard-pressed to even think of an analogy. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think also the value of exploration, in, even in this context carries over beyond the walls of the game itself. You know, if you if you were expecting that you might be asked to do a different version with a different box, then any understanding that you gained in the first condition might be useful in subsequent conditions. And so, I mean, in general, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence that humans and animals are designed to get pleasure from learning how things mm -hmm. work. And so it makes sense that, that part of what you'd want to do is be like, okay, I'm in this new environment with this weird contraption. I don't really know how long I'm going to be in this situation or how many other similar situations I'll be in. So let me just try and figure out what, what's the deal. That seems so, totally reasonable. Yeah. So the ideal strategy is that the person should sit there and press a button without getting any feedback 962 times in a row. Uh, like, this sounds very boring. And I think it's like maybe just <laughs> yeah. know. Like, would you actually do that? You're literally pressing a button. Like, yes. Yeah. I don't know. So this is, a, this is an objection that uh, people have to the uh, biases literature more broadly. That yeah. They set up these incredibly artificial scenarios where the deck is stacked towards uh, people's intuitions about the cases being bad. And then they're like, oh, people don't do the theoretical optimal in this like stupid game mm. that I created uh, to, to uh, engineer that result. It's not, not always like that. Um, you could take that criticism too far. But uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, many listeners will know that there's this whole other school uh, called the heuristics. So, yeah. so there's the biases school and there's the heuristic school. The heuristics uh, people, so that actually people are incredibly good at answering these very complex questions in a good enough way. And that the people who are, people are focusing on like how we're biased are uh, like picking up edge cases, particularly unusual cases where people's intuitions, that the heuristics that they're using don't work. But those are the odd cases rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's right. And I, I would just add too that, you know, there's a, there's a, separate argument that I think resonates with the heuristic school. You know, so there's one argument you could make, which is just, yeah, evolution kind of tuned our parameters for a certain type of environment. Surprise, surprise, when we're in a totally different environment, we don't do the right thing. And so, yeah, that makes sense to me. And in general, computer science has a lot of what are called no free lunch theorems that basically say, if you optimize for a given environment, you will necessarily be worse on other environments that aren't like that. There's no, um, there's often no way to improve uniformly across all environments. There's a separate argument, I think, that also goes in the same direction, which is simply you are paying a cost to think, you're paying a cost to deliberate, to hesitate. And so part of what we're trying to do, I think, at the broadest level in this book is paint a, uh, I think, more recognizable picture of 
rationality that takes computational constraints into account and says, once you start to think about you know, information processing itself as a cost, you end up with a notion of optimality that does look a lot closer to some of these ideas that come out in the heuristic context. There's, there's this concept in experiment design called information leakage, which is basically the, the subjects, you know, gleaned more than we strictly told them. And it's, you know, very difficult to actually kind of grapple with that. And we interviewed one researcher who studies optimal stopping problems in, in human subjects. And he says, yeah, um, it turned out that our subjects were just getting bored. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not irrational to get bored, but it's hard to model that rigorously. And I think, you know, in, in general, when there's a conflict between our models of what decision making should be and what people actually do, we have a choice. We can say, oh, people are stupid or irrational or, or that they have these heuristics that are tuned for a different environment. Or we can say we have the wrong model. We, we have an incorrect formal description of what it is that these people are doing or the problem that they think they're solving. So if I could just recap uh, do, with, with the explore exploit section. So we talked about Gittin's index, then epsilon decreasing strategies, and then kind of a variant on that is the upper confidence bound algorithms, which is kind of appealing because it seems like it would be easier to apply in everyday life to think about you know, what would be a very good case here. Not the very best imaginable, but like a, a very good case and then always go for the thing that has the highest, like very, a very good case, um, at least early on in your life, maybe later in life, not so much. You, you need to uh, be more reasonable, be more realistic. But then there's uh, various different issues that arise when thinking about whether these models are a good a description of real life. So when we've got the discount rate, uh, I'm not too bothered by that because I think at least early in life, people probably should just have uh, a geometric discount rate. Then maybe mm. we have to choose what that discount rate is. So that, that discount rate is one. And you've got a question of not really knowing how long uh, or like how many uh, pulls of the levers you're going to get in your life. Like, yeah, how long do you have to spend at a job before it counts as like a pull of the lever and you've got the mm. measurement? So there's a bit of like arbitrariness there. Then you've got quite perhaps a more severe issue is that nothing changes in these environments. And like uh, we don't have simple algorithms once things start changing, which is how the world is. And also you're not changing the environment uh, at all, which in some cases uh, would be quite important in real life. Uh, you've got uh, switching costs potentially. So changing job is uh, difficult, whereas that's, uh, although that, that seems like you can modify the algorithms, it sounds like, uh, for, to, to account for switching costs. But uh, we we'll, we'll have to look those up. Explore yeah. a bit less. Yeah, so yeah explore a bit less is the, uh, is the rule of thumb there. Then you've got, uh, it seems like some of these described cases where you pull a lever and you either get one or zero, or I guess like one or minus one, because you have to pay or something to, to pull a lever. Yeah, this is um, called the Bernoulli bandit, by the way, if people are interested. Yeah, yeah. So you either get zero or one. Yeah. But in real life, we talked about how there's downsides, not only upside, but that doesn't seem like it's so severe because you just shift the distribution. Uh, yeah, so you've got like one or zero of the outcomes. But you could imagine like it could be a normal curve, a normal distribution mm -hmm. of outcomes, or perhaps a log normal distribution, so like much more uh, spread out. Or it could be power law distributed, so like very massively different outcomes depending on the option they choose. And all of those mean that there's more variance in the outcomes, so you have to explore more. And also that there's like more risk of um, choosing one early that um, misses the top tail, misses the one that in fact has the highest expected value, but you uh, didn't realize that because you didn't sample enough to, to pick up the, the, the upper best tail or potentially the, the, the lower terrible case tail. Um, right. So, um, and then another one <laughs> uh, is that uh, all of these um, are kind of a, a modeling you as coming in with no information. So perhaps you just have a uniform prior belief about um, the possible different outcomes that the levers have. Whereas in real life, kind of almost everyone listening to this is going to be at least sixteen, and they have kind of a model of the world uh, of yeah, what are the probable like yeah, what's the plausible distribution of outcomes of different actions that they can take? No, but you're factoring that in, like, say, with yeah. the upper confidence interval one, you're using everything you know at that point to make your best guess of what the upper confidence interval is. Yeah, I agree. In principle, it's incorporated here, but uh, we haven't really talked about what things would look like if you're like 700 through an 8,000 uh, draw. Uh, we, we, like most of the tables describe, oh, like after three pulls, mm. um, uh, like where you've got, say, two wins and one loss. Whereas in real life, it, t it seems like we have like much thicker information than that we're very rarely coming in blind and so it might be better to model it as like a bayesian issue where you have like a prior and new update based on each each pull which i think may well end up like resembling the solutions i've gotten here anyway yeah i mean of course yeah in real life you're you're making judgments not only about the machine you're pulling but also about the nature of the game itself that you're playing so if if slot machine A pays out much less well than you thought it would, you might start to extrapolate and be like, oh, maybe slot machines just aren't as good of an investment <laughs> as I thought they were. <laughs> and you see this in people 
who are very sur- superstitious about gambling, where they, they're sort of promiscuous in, in what they attach their success and failure to. They get uh, some payout, and then they update their priors on the value of wearing their lucky baseball cap, but also the value of it being 12.04 p.m. with the sun at this angle and being at this mm. particular machine. And so, yeah, I think all of these things, needless to say, point towards the enormous complexity of what real world decision making actually looks like in most cases. Mm. Just with the the restless bandit problem, which is where the payoffs are changing at the different arms. So could I just recap that you were saying that actually people are almost uh, better at doing that than this, the, the simple algorithms we've developed or yeah was... the i mean the restless bandit problem is what's called intractable which means that there is no efficient solution to the problem efficient has technical definition which we can mm-hmm. get into if you want but people seem in a way untroubled by the daunting formal complexity of the problem and they just do stuff and the stuff they do seems to work and this i think has created you know a certain amount of interest in the computer science community of trying to figure out how can we characterize, you know, a computational model of what people are actually doing. And is there a rigorous way to analyze just how good uh, their instincts actually are? And mm-hmm. can that lead us to ideally some sort of algorithmic breakthroughs that we can then use in, in practice? But are, are there any rules of thumb about ways we could modify some of the things, the algorithms we've seen earlier? that would still get you like a better than random payoff when doing restless bandit problems. I mean, it sounds like one thing again is like you should be a little bit more keen to explore. That's certainly true. So the more if you if you think about this at the in the limit of a completely random environment, then you might as well just pull the handles at random if the payouts yeah. are just jumping yeah, all over the place. And so yeah, in, in general, it is true that the more volatile the environment is, the more restless you should be yourself and not, not settling for something and not kind of continuing to act on stale information. So it makes sense. I, th- I mean, I, I might have to check the literature on this, but I would imagine that the win, stay, lose, shift principle is still reasonably better than chance even in the restless condition because if something mm-hmm. paid out, you, you know, it's a reasonable assumption that, you know, you should pull it at least one more time. Mm. Um, so there, there are, I think, very basic heuristics that hold. But in general, it is true that the, the more restless the environment, the more restless you should be too. You're going to end up basically discounting old information. Old pulls get weighted less in measuring yes. like the fraction that it succeeded. So you get some kind of moving average. But yeah, for, I guess for some reason that ends up like being computationally intractable. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you can also consider like, do you know going in how restless the environment is or are you building your model of the noise in the environment based on your experience, which is obviously even more complicated. Mm-hmm. Maybe as a, as a way of kind of summing up the discussion as well, I'd be interested to talk more about trying to get very concrete about mm-hmm. uh, specific career decisions. Yeah. And, you know, like, it does seem like in a way you could think of, well, you have all your different career options open to you. And one way of thinking about it is like each career step takes like one to three years, which is kind of like a job. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> you have a 40 year career. So you've got, you know, 10 or 20 pulls of the lever. And then the question is, you know, which one should you go for? And I was just wondering if you wanted to say like how, how we might attack that based on some of the models we've covered. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's also, I can't help thinking about this in the context of my own career. Uh, you know, I don't know how illustrative that is or how useful that is to listeners, you know, f- from just this anecdotal perspective of how I became a writer. But I was very conscious of the idea that I would take a crack at writing as a profession and find out fairly quickly whether I would succeed or fail and then just do something else. And so in my case, having a computer science background, it was, well, I can always just, you know, roll up to some big corporation and, and get some job. And so I, I didn't have to worry about, you know, becoming destitute if I failed in my writing ambition. And so speaking personally, I felt very emboldened by that to do something very risky and try to write a book proposal and so forth. That was a little bit like the upper confidence interval where you're like, yeah. being writer would be a real like kind of dream job for me. I'm not really sure if I can make it work, but like it's worth giving it a go. And I can always just switch back to the kind of like normal job path afterwards. Yeah. And I, yeah, I remember having a conversation with my 
undergraduate writing mentor. And I was talking to him about, uh, should I go into graduate school and so forth? And his advice to me was, I highly recommend that you only go to graduate school if you can go to a program that's funded. Because part of what you are trying to do is make a life as a writer. And if you graduate from even a really good program with, you know, $50,000 or $100,000 of debt, then that is going to rapidly put pressure on you to either immediately professionalize as a writer or immediately abandon that path because you've got to make your loan payments. And I thought that was really kind of astute advice. And that's not, that's not the kind of advice that fits on the axis of, you know, go for your dreams or not. Um, I thought it was very pragmatic and sort of had this eye to the option value of being in a position to make slightly risky moves as an adult. I thought that was really mm -hmm. kind of astute advice. So that that's something that I think people can think about from the perspective of making those really early decisions about whether to get, you know, for example, if you get a law degree or a medical degree, those degrees are so expensive that it is very hard to do anything other than law or medicine, in part because you need to pay off your law and medicine training. And those are, you know, generally lucrative ways to do that. That's a good example of an, a multi-arm that bandit that actually has a negative payoff because if you go and try and qualify as a lawyer and then you realize you hate this, you've actually invested a ton of money. So you're worse off than you yeah. started. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, th I think I mean, you you guys and, and the 80,000 Hours community surely has thought more about this than I have explicitly. But I think on the whole, people probably spend less time testing those waters than they should particularly because they come with these big switching costs. Well, yeah, so the advice in our career guide that's currently up is kind of like if you are pretty confident that this path seems best, then like probably figure out how to go for that, but obviously have a backup plan, but you know, go for your mainline option. But if you're uncertain, which many people, if you feel very uncertain, which many people are, then we encourage people to make a plan to try out several things over a few years. And, you know, one way you can do that is uh, before graduate school, you often have like a couple of year period and you can kind of do something a bit different and then you can go to graduate school. And mm -hmm. That's a way of kind of ordering things that lets you try out some things. But then when I actually read the book and thought about upper confidence intervals, I wondered if the kind of advice of go and try out a couple of things is actually not quite the right advice. Instead, you should think which thing seems plausibly best mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just do that straight away <laughs> um, right. and like switch later. I mean, that's obviously ignoring many of the the complications we've covered, but uh, it may it may be it may pause the thought that maybe the advice should be more along the lines of do the kind of plausibly best thing uh, yeah. rather than kind of plan to try out lots of things. Well, in a way, you know, you're describing the attention between epsilon decreasing and upper confidence bound. Yeah, and you can you can be buoyed by the fact that they're they both offer you um, you know asymptotically logarithmic regret. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're both part you of that sleep family. Sleep soundly in your bed. Don't yeah, you? yeah. It, actually, there, I'll mention one—a third algorithm that's in that same family, which I think is intuitive, which is what's called Thompson sampling, and that is do something with the percentage of your energy or time or money that is the uh, likelihood of it being the best thing. So, if you're ninety-nine percent sure that you want to be a doctor, then spend ninety-nine percent of your time being a doctor. If you're 50% sure, then spend half your time. And I think it's just this wonderfully intuitive idea. You know, it fits perfectly within a Bayesian framework. 50% of your time over what time horizon? Like, Well, again, this is in the multi-arm bandit problem. So it's just your next pull. You know, okay. With probability 0.5, you pull that and okay. then you get feedback and then you reevaluate. So it's a little bit different again in a, in a sort of slower feedback mode. But, it does. I mean, yeah. it does seem though in the context of advising someone who's really young to think about you know, information gathering for its own sake. So if you're someone who's 24, you've been doing, you're, you're in your first job out of college and you really like it. In some ways, there's this argument, at least from, you know, epsilon decreasing that says, I don't care how good it is. Try something else anyway. Um, you're at that period of time where that's, that's what you need to do is just try stuff. Yeah. So that's what I was going to zoom back. Like if we had, say, you've got 10 or 20 pulls of jobs over your career. I mean, the epsilon decreasing advice is like um you know for my next career step i should almost i should basically flip a 10-sided coin and if it's like 20 percent of the time i should just go and do some like random other option uh and otherwise i should like carry on with the thing that i think is best which you know you sometimes see people doing advice a bit like that where they're like well i've been in this thing for a while i'm not really sure it's doing something for me so i'm just gonna like go and do this like pretty unusual different thing and see where it takes me but it 
on the other hand, feels like very uh, counterintuitive advice just to like do a, a randomly chosen different um, job, like some fraction of the time. I think a, a case where uh, that doesn't work too well are industries where it's kind of winner takes all. So in order to get anything, you have to be the best. And I guess writing is actually a little bit like this. Uh, yeah. Music, uh, academia to some extent, uh, if, you do, if you're in your PhD. Uh, in those cases, exploring too much or trying out lots of things is basically conceding failure that you're never, you're not going to become like the best musician if you like only spend a third of your time doing music because mm-hmm. the competition is so harsh and people only want the best. Whereas there's other, there's other cases where uh, exploration works okay because you just get kind of uh, linear returns to like being better. That's right. So, I mean, this is sort of a case where the machine, the, the payout on the machine grows with the number of times you've pulled that handle. You know, if you pull the like playing the violin handle, first time you just get you know, nothing, but the 10,000th time, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. You get angry phone call from your neighbors. Yeah. So, I mean, that's yet another way in which, you know, the multi arm bandit framework is sort of an imperfect lens for thinking about some of these things. Mm. And, you know, I think in general, I also find that this is something, I mean, yeah, not, not to preach too much, but I think younger people don't quite appreciate the degree to which career paths Put you by default on a trajectory where doing more of that thing becomes increasingly attractive and doing other things, you know, less so. Most corporate jobs are structured in this way, very, I think, cannily so. They, they put you in golden handcuffs, I think is the expression. Exactly. You're like, yeah, you're always waiting the next six months to get the bonus from the previous year. Yeah. I mean, even in the, even in the structure of the way that jobs are set up. So, I mean, just this is an anecdotal example, but being an author, you have this funny kind of life rhythm where, you know, a a draft will come back from your editor or your, you know, proofreader or something like this. And you'll have to work, you know, 14 hours a day, seven days a week for two weeks. And then you hand it back in and then you have nothing to do for two weeks. And this goes on a few times. And then the book goes to production and you have, you know, six months of relative peace and then this huge publicity tour. It is not the kind of thing that you can do while smoothly segueing to your other job. You know, let's say you want to switch careers and so you take a full-time position, but you say to them, I have this publicity tour where I'm going to need to be away for like six weeks, you know, three months from now. That's not going to go over like particularly well. And so, I mean, that's just an anecdotal example, but, you know, you start to notice that, oh, this particular window of time is, is exactly the right amount of time to start researching a new book proposal and then do the publicity and then go back to researching the, the next book, um, it's not as conducive to getting, you know, a full-time job at, yeah. at the corporation. So I, I think a lot of careers, though, have their own version of this, mm. where you find yourself, you know, you open a door. And, that's yeah. exactly right. So, yeah, podcasting is a bit like this, because, uh, like, each episode you gain more subscribers, and so each episode is more valuable than the last because that's more right. people hear it. <laughs> uh, so you could easily end up in this situation where I never should Rubs, have started. hell. <laughs> So I, you could easily end up thinking, well, I never should have started, but now that I'm here, I should definitely continue. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay, so we've started to talk about careers where you kind of have to commit to them and once you get off, it's hard to get back on. And so maybe these might be better modeled as optimal stopping problems, which is another really fascinating chapter you have in the book. And so maybe we could start by just quickly saying how it's different and then... Mm-hmm then some of the approximate solutions to those as well and how they might apply. Yeah, great. So there's a a second genre of problems that are called optimal stopping problems. And this has to do with being presented with a sequence of opportunities, one after another. And at each point in the sequence, you either commit to that particular option, in which case the game's over, or you decline and continue to progress through the sequence. But critically, you can't change your mind and go back. And so the canonical optimal stopping problem is what's called the secretary problem. And the basic idea here is you imagine you're hiring a secretary, uh, you field N different candidates, they show up in a random order, and then you evaluate them, you interview them one after another. And because of whatever constraint, uh, you either have to hire that person on the spot and dismiss everybody else, or you send them away, in which case you lose the ability to change your mind and hire them later. And so the problem here is how do you attempt to hire the very best candidate in the pool, given that you are establishing a a baseline essentially as you go? 
Um, and so there's a risk, of course, that you stop too soon. There's a risk that you establish too high of a standard and then no one after that point exceeds it. And this is another one of these math problems with this kind of wonderfully colorful history through the mid 20th century. And it also has this wonderfully elegant solution, which is that you should spend exactly one over E or approximately 37% of your search just establishing a baseline. So interview 37% of the candidates without an intention of hiring any of them, no matter how promising they seem. And then after that point, be willing to immediately hire the next person who's better than everyone you saw in that first 37%. And this is due to a fascinating mathematical symmetry. Your odds of success in this scenario are also 1 over E, or 37%. And that, that in itself is kind of an intriguing detail, which is that following the optimal strategy, you still fail 63% of the time. It just turns out to be a hard problem. But the optimal strategy and the odds of success are identical regardless of the size of the pool. So as n goes to infinity, you still want to follow this 37% rule. And incredibly, you still have a 37% chance of success, even if the pool is like a million people, which seems crazy. <laughs> um, given, you know, random chance, you would only have one in a million shot of identifying the single best candidate out of all one million. Mm. So this is cancelled out by the fact that you get even more time to collect evidence or something like that. So... Yeah. I mean, um, you, have a, you have a really nice uh, explanation of how the derivation works in the book. So um, that's, yeah, I really encourage someone to for, check that for out. For people who really <laughs> want to like go down the calculus wormhole, yeah. <laughs> so with how this might apply to career decisions is you can kind of imagine you can like either you can keep, you can kind of keep trying out jobs or you can commit to one and then you kind of run with it for a while. And that kind of approach makes more sense in these careers where you kind of can't easily like jump in and out of them, um, but you have to kind of just commit. And maybe we want to think about that more as an optimal stopping problem mm. rather than multi arm bandit, where with multi arm bandit, you can always just like switch to a different lever. Yeah. It's perhaps a, the best match might be relationships because it's uh, particularly <laughs> right. hard to dump someone and then get back <laughs> together with them uh, after you've like tried someone else. Uh, people wouldn't tend to take too kindly to that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's probably easier to go back to your previous job than it is to do that. That's that's true. And this is actually something that people who study optimal stopping model explicitly. In the literature, it's called recall, which is the ability to return to a previous candidate or a previous opportunity. And in fact, in the book, we tell these amusing mini biographies of uh, mathematicians and scientists applying, in some cases, explicitly applying a 37% rule to their dating life with mixed mixed success, I think it's fair to say. But someone who embodies this idea of, of trying to return to a previous option is Johannes Kepler. So after the death of Kepler's first wife, he embarks on this kind of epically arduous series of courtships to try to find the perfect second wife to help him uh, raise his kids and so forth. And he's very frank about this in his letters, um, talking about you know, he really liked the fourth woman that he was courting for her tall build and athletic body. Um, just strange to hear this you know, famous astronomer speaking this way. The fifth woman really got along well with the children. She was even better than number four, but he still persisted. And ultimately, after he spends several years courting a total of 11 different women, he realizes, oh, no, 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 it really was number five all along. And he goes back to her and, you know, musters his best apology and says, I'm, I'm sorry for the half dozen other people I've been dating in the meantime, but if you're not spoken <laughs> for and you can, you know, you can find it in your heart uh, to forgive me, uh, I'd, I'd love to, uh, to get back together. And fortunately for Kepler, she agrees. And uh, according to his biographers, the rest of their lives is quite happy indeed. This was actually one of the bits I found more interesting in the book, because I kind of heard of secretary problem before and the 37% solution. But then you point out that if you add in the complication that you can try to go back to a previous option, which you often do have in real life, but you say there's only a 50% chance of that working, then how does that change the percentage? And if I remember correctly, it means you should actually try out more like half the pool. 61%. 61%. If you have a 50% chance of your apology being accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so it means, but it means you should explore way Quite more. A lot. That's right. Um, yeah. Which, which is, is intuitive. That's right. And so it's interesting, you know, in his diary, Kepler bemoans what he calls his restlessness and doubtfulness 
of, you know, he's kind of beating himself up of why did I keep dating all those different women when number five was so amazing? And if you look at the math, you know, he was following the optimal strategy uh, where you shouldn't be willing to commit until you're 61% of the way through the pool. And so, in fact, he, you know, you could argue that he was doing the, the optimal thing, although it certainly caused him a lot of stress over the years. Okay, so in that chapter, you go through progressively more sophisticated uh, versions or models of this problem. So you start out with the case where all you know is whether this uh, applicant is the best that you've seen so far, and you can't backtrack at all. Right. And your goal is simply to maximize the probability of choosing the very best one. Yeah, and that's a very important thing to highlight. Yes. Right? So I, yeah, that, I think that makes it like not not terribly realistic or not similar to yeah, what people are actually trying to do in real life. So in uh, in the next one, you get information on where people stand as a percentile uh, out of the out of the full uh, pool from which you're uh, drawing applicants. So you know that they're like 50th percentile or 70th percentile. And then you end up with a threshold for hiring based on how many uh, more you're going to see after that one. That's exactly uh, before you run out. Yeah. Then there's the the backtracking one, which allows you some probability of backtracking, which suggests much more exploration. Then you add a, a cost to holding out. So like every period that you don't hire someone, so you don't have the secretary or you're single and you find that unpleasant, uh, which pushes towards obviously hiring somewhat sooner, depending on how large that cost is. And then there's another one uh, where you talk about uh, selling a house and uh, looking mm -hmm. at different offers on a house where this starts, I think, to get a lot more realistic because now you're getting cardinal information about the dollar value that the different people are offering rather than just their ordinal value. So you're not just saying this is better than the previous one. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying, uh, I'm going to get $550,000 for the house. And that compares with like 520. And I think like 600,000 is the uh, largest offer that I'm reasonably likely to get. And so that starts to seem more like a real case. And in that example, I think the process that you describe is for maximizing the expected value that you get for the house, the, the yeah. expected price. Yeah, that, that's right. So I want to highlight, you know, you mentioned this, the difference between cardinal information and ordinal information, which I think is kind of philosophically an extremely deep idea. So with ordinal information, you only know whether any two things are, which of them is better than the other, but you don't know by how much. Um, with cardinal information, you both know which of the things is better and you know by how much it is better. And there's, for me, th this fascinating uh, kind of philosophical uh, theme that goes through math of what is the value of cardinal information above and beyond just the mere ordinal information. And in the case of the secretary problem, your odds of success following the best strategy if you only have ordinal information is 37%. With cardinal information, it's, I believe, 54%. And so it allows you to get the very best candidate in the entire pool more than half of the time. And so I think it's just fascinating to see the additional informational value of cardinal scores being made concrete and, and very explicit. Um, so in the house buying scenario, so what you highlighted there is, again, one of the things that we can tweak in an optimal stopping problem is what is our objective function? So in the classic secretary problem uh, from which the 37% rule is derived, you only care about maximizing the probability that you get the single best candidate in the candidate pool. Anything else is equally bad. So getting the second best is just as bad as getting the very worst. And so the 37% rule is optimized accordingly. There will be a 37% chance, of course, that you skip the best candidate in your calibration period. And if that happens, then you'll never hire anyone else because no one else will be better. And then you'll end up stuck with the final candidate, which is just randomly drawn from the pool. Mm -hmm. So there's a 37% chance right off the bat that you end up with a completely random mm -hmm. candidate. Now, of course, you may find that unrealistic. That doesn't really model how, what people are seeking in that situation. And there are a number of different objective functions that people have played with. So one of the ones that's gotten a lot of uh, traction in the technical literature is what's called uh, minimizing the expected rank. So if you rank all the candidates from 1 to N, what is the strategy that in expectation minimizes the rank order of the applicant that you end up with? There's a whole separate literature on that. And then in the case of selling a house, so this one I think is especially interesting and, and relates to a lot of real world situations. Let's say you pay some sort of fixed cost every week that your house is on the market, you're making mortgage payments or you're paying the utilities or whatever it might be. And your goal is not necessarily to sell the house for the highest possible price, if that means holding out for a really long time. Your goal is to make the most money. And so I think that's interestingly and meaningfully different. And so in this case, you might well be willing to take something that you know is pretty good, 
immediately and get yourself, you know, that whatever that gain or that profit right off the bat. And so in cases like this, there's usually a very straightforward rule that you can apply in the situation. So if you pay, let's say, a fixed cost for every additional offer that you entertain, it should be quite easy to determine the probability that a new offer is better than the one you currently have, and then multiply that by the expected value of that better offer if it is a better offer. Um, so what, what's the chance that it's better? And if it's better, what do I expect it to be? And you just set that equal to the cost. And then that tells you what at what threshold you should accept an offer. And so there's something just kind of beautifully straightforward about that. And it enables you to, I think, confidently just set a price going in and then essentially ignore the offers that come in. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just wait until that threshold is reached and then you're good. So of course, this leads us into the direction of what about situations where y you are adjusting your model of the distribution from which the offers are coming in real time as you're getting offers. And so broadly, the, the way that the literature is divided in optimal stopping, there are what are called no information games. So th these are the ordinal scenarios like the secretary problem where you don't know the distribution from which they're being drawn. You only know the ordinal information. There are so-called full information games where you know that, let's say, you know your secretary's typing test percentile or something, and you know this distribution and candidates are being sampled out of that distribution. The last category is what are called partial information games, where let's say you have cardinal information but you don't know the distribution ahead of time. So you are building a model of the distribution based on the cardinal information that is coming in. Needless to say, the solutions are much less clean in the partial information version, but for better or worse, it also appears to be the best model for most real world situations. Do you have any rough sense of how that changes some of these rules of thumb? So if we started out with 37% and then best, <laughs> I mean, maybe just any of these complications that we've covered. So you mentioned, like, suppose if you're trying to minimize the, uh, what you were saying. The uh, expected rank. Yeah, which seems more realistic because mostly the second or third option is not way worse than the first. Yeah. How would that change, like, how much you should explore? So the basic intuition with the version of the problem in which you want to minimize the expected rank is that you basically have a series of thresholds where initially you're in this purely exploratory phase, so you will not accept any candidate no matter what rank they are. After that point, you should be willing to hire someone if they are the very best candidate you've seen so far. As you start to run out of time, you now switch to a regime in which you're willing to accept someone if they are the best or second best candidate you've seen so far. And then later, if they're the best, second best, or third best. And if you want, we can post... So you, you drop your standards over time. Exactly. Um, yeah, so this is the um, familiar, if not encouraging, advice of, you know, as you start to run out of options, lower your standards. Mm -hmm. um, but the math tells you exactly when and by how much. <laughs> Earlier we were talking about this model where we have um, 20, maybe you have 20 draws in a sense, which each, you could... This is one way of thinking about it. You have a two-year period, which is like trying a job. And then at that point, you can either carry on with that mm. or you could um, switch to a different one how might you attack that kind of model with with these algorithms or or you think there's a better way of setting it up um that's a good question i mean i think partly it depends on what kind of information we want to think about you as getting from this job so you know in the ordinal version of the problem you are basically duty bound to automatically reject the first offer that you see no matter what or the first candidate because you literally have no information about them. All you know is they are the first best candidate out of a pool of one. And so you, there's really no realistic scenario in which you'd ever stick with the first thing. So you right off the bat have a one over N chance of, you know, losing the best opportunity forever because it happened to be the first one out of N that you saw. In a cardinal scenario, you might realize that the very first candidate is exceptional. And even though you're going to get and more draws from that distribution, you're still confident that you have, you're have you in the, the right tail and you don't expect anything else to be better than that. So yeah, in, in the cardinal case, just to recap, that's where after trying the job, we can roughly say, I think this is like a 90th percentile job for me or a 50th percentile compared to the other options that you're considering. 
And then in those approaches, the best thing is to have a threshold. Uh, and if it's, if the job is above the threshold, then you just stick with it. And if it's below the threshold, then you try something else. And the threshold kind of declines over time as your time horizon is, is used up. And so what you were saying is if you, you try your first job and then you're like, whoa, this is actually really good. I think this is maybe like among the best options. Uh, then you might just stick with it because it's above your threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it's like below the threshold, then you try something else. Yeah, that's right. And so I think part of the message that I take away from the math, at least, is that scenarios in which you have some kind of objective scale on which to place things are just, you know, computationally kinder versions of the problem to find yourself in. Now, there's, of course, the question of, is that how the mind works? If you're in a job, do you have a cardinal sense of how much you like the job? Maybe. Maybe you could cash that out as some function of your brain chemistry or over time or something <laughs> well, like this. I think you do. Your yeah. life your life satisfaction in this job. Yeah. Um or if we're thinking about it from an impact point of view, it'd be like how much impact you think you can get. Obviously mm -hmm. impact is easy to quantify. But. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. So uh, my take on this chapter is that the first few models are basically not useful at all because they just deviate too much from real life. But finally, by by the house one, uh, where we've got cardinal information and we're basically setting a threshold, uh, like that's actually starting to get uh, real and I think something that, that we could use in real life. If I think about a real uh, life case, it seems like one thing is that you have a pretty good prior because you've learned a lot from other people's experiences with careers, you know, like the typical level of satisfaction. And so you can roughly place yourself in the distribution of um, kind of how, how happy everyone is with their career. Uh, and also, as, you, as you're saying, you then update uh, on like how much you like careers in general as, as you go. So the Bayesianism is going to like complicate this quite a bit because you've got a pretty decent prior of the distribution and then you shift it around as you learn. Um, you've got some ability to backtrack, but it's limited. You've got like pretty serious cost to delay um, mm -hmm. in your career. Also, so I'm not sure whether this will change it, but uh, many possibly, like many candidates for a job uh, would be negative. So in fact, yeah. you, you always have this reserve option of not hiring anyone, which gets you zero value, uh, but you at least avoid a negative outcome. And that's, I think, something that's not included in these models typically that you can just re reject everything. Yeah. So, I mean, I can mention that there's uh, an interesting variation of the classic secretary problem where your objective function is you get plus one for choosing the best candidate in the pool, minus one for choosing anyone else. And zero for making no choice at all. In this case, the optimal stopping threshold is one over the square root of E, which is approximately 61%. And so this indicates that there is a major difference in how you approach something based on how you rate the downside of making a mistake versus the experience of, you know, leaving that position unfilled or, or not buying the house at all or whatever it might be. Not selling, yeah. Not selling, exactly. Mm. And so, you know, I guess one analogy then you could make to the dating uh, realm would be if you're perfectly content to be single and you're happier being single than married to the someone who's going to make you unhappy, mm. then you should, as one might expect, be much more choosy. And I, so I think it's, I mean, that's obviously intuitive, but the math bears that out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll stick up a link maybe to that formula. I'll chase it down in one of the footnotes. <laughs> yep. Uh, another interesting uh, property is uh, that other people can steal your experimentation, uh, especially when you're uh, trialing uh, people on a job. So you get an imperfect signal of how someone, uh, how good someone will be uh, with their job application or their interview or their, their work trial. Uh, and then if you hire someone and they turn out to be really good, then they they now have evidence that they can use to show other people that they're really good. And then um, other people will uh, poach them potentially at a higher salary. This actually is like a huge issue in economics. <laughs> I know in labor economics, there's like a systematic bias against trying new candidates, people who don't have a job record, because the, mm. the company that hires them doesn't get to keep the evidence that they've produced. It becomes public information. Oh, so maybe set that aside. It's just an interesting example of, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of economics literature on optimal stopping as a model for both sides of the hiring process. So mm. employers are vetting different candidates for an opening and they're deciding, do we make this guy or girl an offer? Do we hold out and keep the position unfilled, but we'll, that person will probably get some other job. It also models the employee side of the equation where you're fielding offers and you're deciding, do I take this job at salary X and location Y? Or do I keep searching? But if I keep searching, then I might not be able to, you know, keep that offer on the table. And so, for example, there had been kind of a longstanding paradox in economics of how you could have unfilled vacancies and unemployed job seekers in the same market at the same time. 
And one of the things that kind of unlocked that riddle was the idea that you could, in fact, model both of these sides as simultaneously playing an optimal stopping game, you know, with respect to the other. Yeah, this is a search model of unemployment. I yeah, think, exactly. yeah, it was a Nobel Prize for that. If we applied all these complications to then, again, the, the kind of um, choosing a career path decision, how do you think that would shift around the... Well, it, actually, it seems to me like in this chapter, um, once you've got this example, it's basically actually the same uh, process as we were using previously with the um, threshold, uh, the upper, upper confidence bound. Because with, with, with the house case, you say, uh, where you're trying to like maximize the value of the sale and you have a cost to delay. Uh, you, you say, basically, you like figure out a range of plausible uh, uh, bids that someone might make, say, between $400,000 and $600,000. And then that's like, yeah, so you've got the, the lower and the higher, and then you know the cost to delay relative to that range, and then that determines what your threshold will be in that term. And I guess if all of the parameters are constant for every turn until you actually sell. So you basically just, again, have this threshold based on the parameters that is going to be very similar to the upper threshold uh, thing in the previous example, except that that one you update more as you get more information. Whereas in this one, you just assume that it's kind of a constant range that, that you never... Wait, so once you've got the threshold, what, what determines whether you accept it or not? So if I make a $500,000 bid? Yeah, so there's a formula where uh, it depends on how unpleasant it is to uh, turn down a bid and wait for the next one. Mm-hmm. So what's the cost of delay? Okay. So you've got basically, uh, yeah, two different things. One is... The magnitude of the range, which in this case, I guess would be $200,000. And then you figure out how frequently the bids come in. And then you figure out what is the cost of delaying yeah. to wait for another bid. So it's $10,000. Yeah. So if it's like $10,000 a week and you get one bid a week or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I can give you some actual numbers if you want. Sure, so, yeah. you know, we walk through this example in the book of imagine that you're selling a house and you're expecting offers uniformly distributed from $400,000 to $500,000. So this is probably not realistic in the Bay Area. (laughs) So if the cost of waiting is only $1 per offer, then you should set your threshold at $499,552.79. And that means if anyone offers you over that, you take it. Exactly. Otherwise, you keep waiting. Exactly. If waiting costs you $2,000 an offer, uh, you should hold out for $480,000. If waiting costs you $10,000 an offer, it goes down to 455000 And then lastly, if the cost of waiting exceeds 50% of the range over which offers are expected to come, then that means you should literally take anything because the cost of fielding an additional offer exceeds the expected value of doing so. Awesome. Mm. So, so I really like how these two processes for I guess like similar cases have converged on basically a very similar heuristic where you, where you set a threshold and like yeah go above or accept anything above and not below it's also interesting that in both cases you've slipped Bayesianism in the back door here because <laughs> in, in reality with the house you've got a probability distribution of uh, like prices so you could get something below $400,000 if you're very unlucky or yeah. something above $600,000 if you're very lucky but you're kind of going to say at 5th percentile and 95th percentile or 90th percentile and 10th uh, percentile it's kind of just what we were talking about last time with what like threshold should you choose i guess in this case it's going to be a bit clearer there probably is like an optimal threshold at least for a normally distributed set of bids yeah uh, whereas in the previous one it depended on how many turns there are left how many levers you pulled i think it was yeah how many levers you pulled yeah right so in this case you basically have the um luxury at least the way that we're currently modeling this right so you have the luxury of going into the situation with a complete knowledge of the distribution from which the offers are going to get drawn. In reality, you know, you have a, a partial sense of that. You know, you if your first several offers are disappointing, you think hmm, maybe the market's cooling down or, you know, whatever. And and I think a Bayesian framework is probably the right way to think about how you should be doing that. There's some work on how you should incorporate prior experience in other versions of the problem when you then face an additional version. And I think the rule of thumb is something like Consider all of your prior experience, basically tack that on to the beginning of the candidate pool, and then imagine that you've already sort of been through that. Mm. So if you previously hired a position where there were 10 candidates, you interviewed four of them and let's say chose the fourth, then the next time you're hiring, you can essentially prepend those first four uh, and imagine yourself now in a new version of the problem where you, you're you're starting on candidate five, as it were. Yeah. So there are some nice. nice heuristics for thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking how we'd set up the model. So if we were going to use, does it make sense to maybe we could try using life satisfaction as the scale, though? I guess that's not a fully uh, cardinal scale, but 
Maybe with life satisfaction, you kind of got a situation where you know that like most jobs are around a seven out of 10 for life satisfaction, but like a few are nines and a few are like fives. And now say you don't know anything about the job before you take it and then you take it and you find that it's an eight out of 10. And then the question is, should you uh, now carry on with that or should you keep exploring? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as, as with all these things, it's going to depend on exactly what are your assumptions going in. Um, you know, are you assuming that you have a ordinal versus cardinal sense of your life satisfaction? Can you make use of, you know, reports of other people who have been in that profession? You know, there's some interesting psychology work to the effect that people are worse at predicting their future life satisfaction than they think, but other people's reported self life satisfaction are more relevant yeah, uh, to you than you would think. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, that kind of fits into it. Well, then you guess you just bypass this whole thing because you should just go into whichever one has the highest average satisfaction, except for those um, massive um, selection effects and things. Yeah. Um, you're not re- you're not similar to the people who are already in a job. You start to wander into some interesting territory, depending on which of these kind of assumptions you tweak. You know, uh, Rob, you were mentioning earlier this sort of game theoretic effects of if you interview someone, then perhaps other people get to know how good that person is also. There's some interesting work on sort of an ecological analysis of something like the multi-armed bandit problem, where everyone in a given society is basically playing this game of chicken where everyone wants someone else to do the exploration. Like it's rational for any individual to be pursuing a much more heavily exploitation-based strategy as long as someone somewhere else is creating the information. Mm -hmm. And part of what I find kind of charming and counterintuitive about this is that you realize that people who are very exploratory by nature are performing a public service. Like we think about people who have this disposition of being very novelty seeking, always trying new stuff. Um, There's almost a stigma with that personality type where we think of it as sort of selfish or hedonistic or, um, you know, they're, they're, out for their their own thrills or whatever but in fact they are kind of taking one for the team they're they're martyring themselves to be the explorer and if they find something that is no good then they alone have paid the price but if they find something great then they've created this public externality of now everyone goes to that restaurant or whatever as, as long as there's not a downside tale if there's like lots of negative risk that especially uh, negative risk that other people bear then, oh, then it's true. that. Uh, so like if it's yeah. finding new technologies or something and there's a chance you discover it. That kind of thing, yeah. I think, I think that so. might be part of where the uh, stigma comes from, is that uh, mm-hmm. people like that often take risks that other people have to suffer from. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, I guess, implicitly imagining some kind of hunter-gatherer so where it's just you go eat the weird mushroom and <laughs> the mushroom doesn't kill everyone else. <laughs> yeah. That's a point we actually are somewhat making in an upcoming article, which is if you there's thinking of about doing good as an individual, but often what we're doing is actually doing good as part of a community. Yeah. And in that you very much have that dynamic where it becomes more valuable to explore um, because then other people can make use of what you find and you get this um, externality over the community. Yeah, that's right. So one, one of my favorite interviews that we did in the book was uh, the editor at Pitchfork, whose name is Scott Plagenhoff. And he was talking about, you know, just what is, what is the affect of being a music critic? Like, what is the, the lived experience of being a music critic? And he was saying, you know, you, th- you think about a music critic's life as you're someone with, like, this very specific musical taste. You get to listen to music all day long. And he said, in reality, it's, it's actually, like, hellacious because you're specifically someone who has very high standards in music because you've heard, you know, all of the music and you know exactly what you like and what you want. And yet you're forced to wade through this just ceaseless stream of, you know, mostly bad stuff. Um, And so he was telling us how he would physically remove his favorite artists from, you know, his phone so that he couldn't break in his resolve to keep (laughs) listening to the the new things. And so I think there's, again, that aspect that we don't fully appreciate that you know, there are people in society or in any organization or any tribe that are in a way exploring so that others may exploit. And as a form of martyrdom, I think we should kind of recognize that. Yeah, I think that information economics and especially information externalities uh, might make my like top 10 list of most important concepts. And I think it's a very yeah. underrated uh, idea, the fact that uh, the market for goods, like, yeah, um, 
the, the drinks that we're having and the food that we eat and the furniture that we have in our houses is very good. But the market for information is garbage, absolute garbage, because it, it's not privately controlled. Mm-hmm. Uh, we try with patents and copyright. It doesn't really work, especially not with like uh, news and lots of kinds of evidence. And also, uh, at least in, often in the case of politics, the people who you might expect would want the information or the people who would benefit from it existing in general don't necessarily want to consume it themselves uh, mm-hmm. because, because all of the impacts that they have in terms of how they vote are also externalities. So you've got like both uh, the supply side and the demand side are seriously broken, uh, which I think actually is like a fundamental reason that uh, lots of things in society don't work. Very often you see that there's like information economics, but basically there's, there's no reason to expect the free market to produce good outcome here. Uh, mm. And so while we're, we're very rich materially, we can be like very poor informationally. Um, That's a mm. succinct description <laughs> of society at the moment, it feels. There are some interesting papers, if people want, we can put links up that have looked at these sort of you know, evolutionary or ecological models of you're a society in some environment, what percentage of your society should be these people with this very exploratory disposition? What percentage of your society should be these Mm. conservative exploiters who are just doing the safe thing? Um, And you can find sort of optimum levels of of that, you know, at a population level, rather than thinking at the level of an individual decision maker. That would be really, yeah, that'd be really relevant to us. Mm. Interesting. Uh, let's move on to randomness and simulated annealing, the uh, third case. Maybe this is a good moment to uh, just take a step back and uh, distinguish like what are the fundamental differences between these three models and where you'd want to apply each one. Yeah. So I guess the first one, you have multiple different discrete options that you're kind of choosing between and you get to do them again and again. And switch between them. In the second them. one, uh, the distinctive thing is that you want to choose one best one at the end and you uh, can't necessarily return to previous options. This is one where it seems like you want to create kind of a structure or a combination yeah. of things by the end rather than just like choose one out of many options. It's about how they are interlinked. And especially when the search space is so like the issue is that the, the space of possible options is so vast that you can't try them all. And instead yeah. you have to have some process for sorting through them or yeah, searching through them. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess take it away. Yeah. So I think one, one of the key differences in sort of moving into the idea of simulated annealing is that in a lot of the cases that we've looked at so far, the options that we're considering are essentially independent. So, you know, if you pull the lever on machine three, that doesn't really tell you anything about machine four. Um, it doesn't suggest anything about you should try something else in that neighborhood or something at the other side of the room or whatever. But there are a lot of cases in life where the space of possible options actually has meaningful local information. And options that are similar in this, you know, decision space have similar outcomes. And so you can model the space of possibilities as some kind of high dimensional space. And so there's this idea of what's called the error landscape. And you can move around on this error landscape in local ways. So, I mean, one example would be, I mean, the the, the classic optimization problem in this area that I have in mind is what's called the traveling salesman problem where you are trying to visit all these different cities, you want to put together some itinerary that visits them all and doesn't go to the same city twice, let's say, and your goal is to minimize the total trip. So you can think about moving through this parameter space as, let's say you switch the order in which you visit just two out of those cities. Well, it's likely that that is going to have a similar trip length. And so you can think about options as kind of contiguous in this way. So the simplest approach is what's called hill climbing. So in hill climbing, again, using this metaphor of the, you know, fitness landscape or the air landscape, you simply look around in your immediate environment. And if some local modification is better, then you just do that. So in the traveling salesman case, it would be you swap the order in which you visit two of the cities and now you visit them in reverse order. If that is lower total mileage, then okay, great. You adopt that change and then you pick two other cities at random and you see if swapping them is better. And you just keep doing this and making these incremental improvements, these like small local changes that improve you slightly until you eventually find yourself in a situation where no local permutation is better than what you currently have. Uh, and this is what's called a local maximum or a local minimum, depending on if you want to think about yourself as trying to go up or down. And the problem that any optimization person faces is trying to figure out essentially how to get out of these local minima or local maxima. So you've hill climbed your way to this particular trip itinerary that is 
better than any local modification. Now what? And so the question of now what leads to this whole family of, of different answers for dealing with making progress in these landscapes. And uh, many of them, if not most, uh, involve strategic use of randomness. So for example, one idea is what's called shotgun hill climbing. So in shotgun hill climbing, every time you get to this local maximum, you just completely start over from a completely random point, And then you start hill climbing from there. If you do this enough times, mm -hmm. eventually you'll find local maxima that are better and better. So that's one extremely simple technique. There's another idea that's what's called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And that says, when you try this local permutation, if it's better than what you're currently looking at, do it. If it's worse, maybe still do it anyway. <laughs> Um, and, you know, in particular, the percentage or the likelihood that you adopt this thing, even though it's worse, uh, should be proportional to how much worse it is. But this is one strategy for trying to make progress, even if you're kind of locally stuck. Um, there's an even simpler idea called jitter, which just says when you get stuck, jiggle some things around at random and then go back to mm -hmm. So the Metropolis algorithm says build a little bit of randomness into every move that you make. And then the idea that's kind of built on top of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm is what's called simulated annealing. And so there's a, a cool backstory to simulated annealing that goes to IBM uh, in the 1980s, I want to say. IBM is doing this really complicated optimization where they're trying to fit the circuits on their chips in you know the most compact and efficient way. And it involves all these super complicated dependencies of, you know, if we move this thing over here, then we have to reroute this wire, da 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 And it just so happens there's this guy at IBM who's like the chip layout guru. And for some reason, he comes up with better layouts than anyone else can. And he won't tell anyone else how he's doing it. And he's... Does he know? That's <laughs> ambiguous in the book, is whether it, uh, he's hiding his particular knowledge or whether he just can't describe it. It's ineffable. Um, I was not able to interview the guru, yeah. I, so I didn't hear his version of that story, but that, I think that's a, that it is kind of a tantalizing question. Mm. So a group of other researchers at IBM were sort of frustrated at the, the, the cult of personality that this person was kind of cultivating around himself, and they thought, well, let's try to approach this in a bit more of a repeatable and rigorous way. And one of the people involved in this was Scott Kirkpatrick. And at this point, he thought of himself not as a computer scientist, but as a physicist. And so he was really interested in how materials cooled. So if you heat something up and then it cools, sometimes it turns into a crystal. Sometimes it turns into glass with no like uh, crystalline structure. And often this has to do with just the speed at which you cool it. So if you cool it really, really slowly, you're going to get a crystal. If you cool it really quickly, you're going to get a glass. And so this got him thinking about this analogy of temperature in real space is kind of random Brownian motion. And this is kind of analogous to this random motion in a hill climbing situation that the Metropolis Hastings algorithm embodies. So what if we attempted to use this annealing metaphor. So annealing is the process of cooling this material slowly to create these um, ordered structures. What if we started with this randomness dial cranked all the way to 11 and then slowly, slowly decreased it until eventually by the end we were just purely hill climbing. It turns out that in fact this works exceptionally well and it's still to this day one of the best practices in optimization. And at first of course uh, their community is very skeptical of this kind of analogy-based idea of like, okay, you found this kind of parable of this is kind of like cooling a piece of glass. That's cute. But it was producing better designs than the guru was coming up with. And then, of course, the scholarship caught up and, and found that this is, in fact, you know, a, a really good way to approach problems that are this complicated. So to kind of recap the solution... You're dealing with some kind of a problem, you've got a bunch of parameters and you're trying to find which parameters maximize the outcome you're going for. And then you do that in a bunch of steps. And so one step, you take one of the parameters and you try jiggling it one way or the other, adjusting it one way or the other. And then when that happens, either it can be better than before, in which case you always go for that, mm -hmm. or it can be worse, in which case you um, sometimes go for it and sometimes don't. And that's, you have this kind of random randomness parameter. And then basically the, the chance that you go with the worst option anyway, just to explore it, uh, goes down over time. 
yeah. and that's the uh, that's the annealing part of it, part of it, um, which then just goes back to the concept we covered right at the start, where generally you want to explore more early to do more random stuff early, and then focus more and more on what you think is already best uh, over over time. And then maybe this can apply to certain aspects of career decisions because sometimes what you're doing with a career looks a bit like a kind of design problem mm. where say you're in a you're in a job and there's various ways you can kind of adjust how that is so you could like work at home or you could like work in the office or you could work more on sales or you could work more on product design and you like don't know which of these things is going to be best for you and what this process might kind of suggest is uh early on you should you know you should keep experiment trying different ways of doing all these things and you know if you find a thing that's better you can move into that and that's your hill climbing and then occasionally you're gonna like you're just gonna do something that you think is probably worse but um you're just gonna do it anyway because <laughs> right. uh maybe it will turn out to be better yeah and you that might unlock a whole new kind of area of things for you that uh, you would have just missed otherwise if you hadn't had that randomness but then you're going to commit more and more to the things you think are best over time. Yeah, I think one key idea here that differentiates it, say, from something like upper confidence bound in a bandit context is it's not necessarily that you think this new thing will turn out to be better. Usually the way these problems are constructed is you just literally know it's worse. You know, the, the chip design uses <laughs> more silicon or uses more copper or whatever. It's that this might be sort of a segue or like an isthmus to a different part of the space. And so it might be that, for example, just taking a chip design that looks really good and then moving the power supply to the other corner, leaving everything else the same is super bad. But <laughs> once you then start optimizing around that, you end up in a different part of the space mm. and you end up with something that's better overall. It seems to apply this to real life. You'd have to think about different properties of your life where the con like that there's many of them that can be like flipped in different ways so you've got maybe the profession that you're in the company that you work at the city that you're in the friends that you have where you live the kind of, uh, whether you work from home or not and you can't it's not possible in your lifetime to explore all of the possible combinations there uh, i guess you can imagine if you're you could plausibly even be in a very good situation a very good combination you're like no i'm going to mix it up and change all of them and then like start from there and then climb that's again that's like the shotgun like, algorithm yeah. shotgun yeah. algorithm that's probably unrealistic in someone's life because well though uh, sometimes you get someone like well i've kind of optimized what i can in this company yeah. and i feel like this is as good as it's going to get in this organization so now i just need to like try a totally different yeah. job or company or I suppose it might be more realistic if you find that co the combination that you're in seems really bad that you just want to throw it out and then like yeah. just switch all of them to, to a different combination and start from there again. Uh, or especially if you can like kind of foresee that as you tinker with these things, it's never going to be great. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess maybe so the way that process could come out is like, this is like a super simple example, but suppose you're like working remotely now doing web engineering and then you like say, I'm going to like try out working as marketing. And you know that working remotely as a marketer is like strictly worse than your current job. <laughs> but then if you go and become a marketer and you change some other things, such as uh, working not remotely anymore, yeah. <laughs> maybe right. that actually turns out to be better than where you were before mm -hmm. and being kind of like willing to just like try on being a marketer for a while lets you uncover that like new combination that you would have never covered if you were not willing to kind of first take that step that was unpleasant. Yeah, I mean, it's certain aspects of life lend themselves to different degrees to this idea of like being parameterized. But I think it is true that often there are dependencies between certain aspects of life. So like if my job is in San Francisco and I live in San Francisco, those two things are optimized with respect to one another. And if I take a job in New York, but I still live in San Francisco, <laughs> yeah. there, that, there's going to be some huge disutility there of I'm going to be you know, on an airplane all the time. And so I guess it, there is a sense in which the different aspects of our life, you know, have a kind of continuity or a kind of synchrony between the different parts that makes it resemble one of these kind of high dimensional landscapes. And so, yeah, it's interesting to think about what are the local modifications that could segue you to a different part of the space. You know, you, you transfer to a different company that's just across the street, but then they open a new office in Bangladesh and then suddenly now that takes your life in a totally different direction. But you never would have just applied for a job in Bangladesh. So there are, I, I guess, senses in which we can move through this space of possibilities in a more or less contiguous way. So you can sort of think of it in these terms. Yeah, another thing is this model only applies if the combination has special properties. It, if, if you just add up the value of each one separately, then you just yeah. optimize on each one individually. Uh, it's only if there's like some uh, kind of chaotic function of, of the combination yeah. that you need to do this random uh, hill climbing thing.
And my favorite analogy for this is uh, jimmying a lock, right? So jimmying a lock works by optimizing each pin on its own. Yeah. You just figure out how, where to put that one pin, and then you move to the next pin, and you figure out where to put that. So that's that's kind of the difference between like the full combinatorial complexity of needing to uh, adjust all of these things at once versus treating them as totally independent. And of course, you just decompose the problem. Yeah, there was just um, another issue with these exploration puzzles is that um, how we set the time horizon might not be as intuitive as it first seems mm -hmm. because uh, I think you actually need to take into account discounting. So we were considering a case where you've got a 40 year career and then you've got like 20 steps uh, or 20 jobs you can try. But actually, I think you should discount that time so you should care less about the steps that are far into the future than the immediate ones. And I mean, this maybe is less true in your personal life, but I think it's quite true in social impact because many of the world's problems are urgent. And there's an issue of like how urgent and that's, that's, a, that's a whole giant article we have. But generally we think there's kind of, there's generally reason to contribute earlier rather than later or else, or else equal. And then you can sometimes model that with a discount rate. And so that actually might mean your kind of exploration budget is quite a bit lower than it first mm. would naively seem if we were just going to go back to a kind of very simple, you should explore for epsilon of the jobs and then exploit after that. Actually, I think if you say, I don't actually remember the specific figures, but if you have like 40 years ahead of you and then you're discounting at 5% a year, then I think the kind of like discounted length of the career would only be like 20 years or something. Yeah. Uh, and so that would actually roughly like half the exploration period. I think that's very interesting. One of the things that I feel is true in human life that is absent from almost all of these problems is that your utility function is on some kind of a drift where when you're 50, you're just going to care about different stuff. Like when you were 10, you were... Pretty different priorities <laughs> than I have now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. a good personal reason to discount a bunch as well. Yeah. And so... It would be interesting to think about how you how you try to optimize a problem where literally your objective function is changing as you're moving through the problem. <laughs> it's um, like the information you're getting and the uh, value of the combination that you found is uh, degrading over time. Well, what's the term? It's like going stale, both because yeah. the world's changed and you're changing. So that yeah can potentially have quite a high discount rate or like spoilage rate, I suppose. Of the yeah yeah because our initial thought was like you know generally people probably need to explore a bit more than they typically do. But then actually thinking about, say, you might want to have a reasonably high discount rate from a social impact point of view, that might actually push you much more back towards just like do the thing that is your best guess. And actually, we're also pointing out here the fact that this is now just going back to a personal point of view. If, you're, if your priorities are changing and the world's changing a lot, then again, information becomes less valuable and you should again just do the thing that like seems best <laughs> right away. Right, kind of locally. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, a bit unsure how that all shakes up in the end. Well, I think also... You we'll know, spend the next 10 years figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then exactly. the answer will be wrong by then anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you know, certain things, you know, certain things give you option value regardless of what your objectives are going to be. You know, so putting yourself in a position where you have kind of... Regardless of what your 40-year-old self is actually going to be motivated by, you know, having more money is probably going to be useful regardless of what those goals are. Uh, knowing more people is probably going to be useful regardless of what those goals are. In general, when you're dealing with like super uncertain decisions, like there's a few strategies you can take. One is to just gain more information and then figure it out. But then the other one is to kind of somehow keep your options open such that it doesn't matter what happens, you're going to be fine anyway. Yeah, um, or, you know, sort of aim for the middle of this objective function space. <laughs> where you don't know exactly what kind of 40 year old you're going to be but you know you certain things are predictable and other things um you know may be useful across a wide range of goals that exactly is going to have yeah so we like talk about that being like flexible career capital yeah where like the career capital is the stuff that puts you in better position in the future and then you can either have narrow career capital that's like only useful for one path or you can have flexible that's like useful to lots of paths. Mm -hmm. And the more uncertain you are about what's going to happen, the more you should care about flexible rather than narrow. Yeah, I capital. think that's right. So another thing that you talked about in the randomness chapter is that there's a lot of problems which are intractable computationally. You can't figure out kind of an analytic solution where you have just a yeah. formula that spits out a number. But often you can figure out the answer just by sampling randomly from the, the, the space of possible cases and then see what's the mm -hmm. distribution of answers that it, that it has to those yeah. specific ones. Um, and interestingly, I think this actually applies here because we've got this question of do people tend to explore too much or too little, which I think given all of the complications that we've discussed, the discount array, <laughs> like the changing yeah. situation, it's actually yeah. computationally intractable. 
But what we really need is an experiment uh, where we get yeah. people to explore more or less and then see whether their lives get better or worse. A really nice uh, case of this, uh, which I stick up a link to, is uh, the, the, the two economists from the, the Freakonomics uh, team. They did this experiment where they got people who were really on the fence about whether to quit doing something or continue doing it. So it's mm. like persevere or give up. And they then, so, so they'll, they'll get them to describe their situation on, on this website uh, and get them to really think about whether they were on the fence. And then if they were still on the fence, they would flip a coin for them and tell them to either quit or persevere. <laughs> um, and then they followed up six months or a year later to see whether they were happy with their decision. So this is a great thing. It would really, I think, be impossible any other way to find out whether people quit too much or too little. But because they found people who were really uncertain and we might find ourselves in a similar uncertain situation, now we can see which way we're biased, uh, all things considered with the world as it is. Turns out people should quit more. Uh, ah. people, people who were told to quit did quit more, the thing more often and they were happy. And that was actually, I think, what they expected. Uh, so perhaps unfortunately, maybe they rigged the experiment some way to, to give the answer that they wanted. But they thought uh, people just find it very hard to give up on something that they've tried before. They kind of uh, continue throwing good money after bad or good time after bad. Mm-hmm. It's just qu- classic sunk cost fallacy or status quo bias. And- yeah. Yeah, right. These kinds of things. And so saying, uh, yeah, I guess if listeners, if you're on the fence about quitting something, maybe you should give it up, to, <laughs> give, give it up today. One thing that t- in my mind at least is connected to this is uh, there are times where you think you're on the fence about something, but you're really not. You're just telling yourself that you are. And I remember a time in my life when I was deciding whether or not to move to the Bay Area. And I thought that I was on the fence, but... I noticed that I only wanted to go to my favorite restaurants and I only wanted to hang out with my close friends. I didn't want to go to parties and meet new people. I didn't want to go try the new bar that opened up. And I was able to identify, I am exploiting. I am acting like someone who is at the end of their horizon in a place in their life. And so even though I'm telling myself this narrative of being on the fence I'm not acting like someone who's on the fence. I'm acting like someone who's, move, you know, moving to a new chapter in my life. And so that that was part of what actually helped me kind of get over that hill and make that decision. It's that classic decision-making procedure where they say, oh, yeah, you're really on the fence? Okay, well, you should just let a coin decide then. So flip the coin <laughs> and then, like, see how you feel when the coin yeah, is exactly. in the air. Would you really want to follow the decision that's uh, that it's going to produce? And I think often, no, you know which way you want it to fall. Yeah. This idea, though, that, you know, there are certain things that are best established by just trying them i think is a very deep idea and it's a a big part of computer science you know so there's this whole set of techniques called monte carlo methods Mm -hmm. which are essentially that it's just you try something a bunch of times and you estimate the outcome based on how those samples go so the main reason Mm -hmm. i think economists think you can't really have a centrally planned economy is that you need much more experimentation than what Mm -hmm. like uh, a central government can can provide you need everyone to be like exploring some of their local space to help like get, get the entire thing into a good combination and that's, I mean, that's been a theme in our advice as well, because basically there's not many predictors of job performance or job satisfaction or yeah. they're, they're not very accurate. And the things that are most accurate often amount to actually trying the work. So like work samples are much more accurate than an interview, right. for instance. Right. And again, I think this is one of these things where we have this idea of rationality that is a little bit of a character and we think, oh, well... It, if I were being more rational, I would think this whole thing out and, and, you know, analytically derive the distribution from which, you know, these things are being drawn. I think there's kind of a reassuring idea that comes out of computer science that says, no, it, just trying something is valid. You know, so the idea of Monte Carlo simulation uh, goes back to the scientist Stanislaw Ulam, who was convalescing in the hotel playing solitaire and being a mathematician started wondering, well, I wonder what percentage of the 52 factorial starting positions in solitaire are solvable. Some of them are are known not to be. And he's thinking about how he would analytically determine this. And he settled on the idea that he would just play the game um, (laughs) and just figure out what percentage of the time he won. Um, And so I think it's, it's in a way a real validation that, uh, you know, someone as smart as him kind of accepted that some ex- things were yeah, impactable. Exactly. And and that there there really is some legitimacy to the idea of just sampling, just trying it. All right. I think uh Ben, you've got a you've got to head out. I guess that kind of uh, wraps up the exploration exploitation uh discussion or the Yeah, thanks so much. I found it super fascinating. My pleasure. Yeah. 
Uh, so one of the most important cases where this exploration question comes in is deciding what problem to work to solve in the world. Uh, so individuals have to kind of make a decision about what, are they going to specialize on global catastrophic risks or poverty or something else. And I guess uh, charitable foundations also have to think about how they're going to allocate, um, how they're going to distribute the, the money that they have in their endowment between different problems that they're interested in fixing. What do you think this kind of research has to, has to say about uh, those cases? Yeah, I think that this idea of budgetary allocation connects to some of these ideas from the explore exploit trade-off. You know, this is, in fact, the initial motivation for John Gittens was to help uh, the Unilever Corporation figure out how to allocate their budget. And I think there's a, there's a really simple idea that's quite powerful in this context, which is called Thompson sampling. And this is the idea that you should figure out your subjective probability that you think something is the best thing to do, presumably through Bayes' rule. Hmm. Uh, and then you should just allocate exactly that percentage of your resources to it. So if you think something is 12% likely to be the best option, then you should spend 12% of your time or 12% of your money on it. And it's this very intuitive idea, but it's got a lot of kind of powerful mathematical support in terms of uh, it's a regret minimizing strategy and a multi-armed bandit problem and has a lot of nice properties as well as being very intuitive interesting so that's it's optimal under some particular assumptions that aren't too crazy yeah yeah right huh okay yeah i guess with a, at, a, at a personal level though because uh, the gains from specialization are so strong um it seems like that gives you more pressure to just go all in on on your top bet although with a foundation where you have many different staff and probably different program areas it seems like you can divide the the funding more yeah i think that's right i think yeah. that's right yeah it might be the case for an individual person mm. that you know spending Five percent of your time doing brain surgery is probably far worse than <laughs> spending none of your time doing it. <laughs> yeah. Are there any kind of decisions that you think people should randomize more in life? We think they are systematically against trying new stuff. Um, this is a good question. I do think that there are a lot of reasons to embrace serendipity, and I think that's a version of kind of allowing randomness into your life. So I think increasingly. The market is kind of moving society or society is moving the market or, or both in this direction towards everything being a choice. And there's something a little bit dangerous about that. I think when things are not a choice to begin with, then you get your randomness kind of for free. You know, a certain song just happens to be on the radio or you happen to bump into someone uh, at, in some common area and they start talking to you about something. With Spotify, there's less randomness. It's all chosen for you after once it's learned your taste. <laughs> right, right, which is which can be quite dangerous, actually. Yeah, yeah, and because you'll never find a new genre unless you go out of your way to do it. Right, and if you do, it it requires some sort of concerted process of choice of actually, you know, overriding whatever its default thing is, and then picking something which you're not really qualified to do. So I think it's it's worth remembering that you know noise has a role. Randomness has a role, serendipity has a role. And I think increasingly we are kind of pushing those things out of our lives. And we do that maybe at our peril. I, th I think we're starting to appreciate the value that those things have. In the book, you make the argument that the world, in a sense, is more static now than it used to be. Uh, you, yeah. You, make, you say hunter gatherers, you know, they've got like different kinds of food that they would eat all the time and it could be different uh, day to day or week to week. Uh, whereas a Coke is a Coke is a Coke. So like industrial <laughs> yeah. standardization tends to make the world less variable. On the other hand, it seems like we have access to way more potential products now than we used to. So one of those cuts against exploration, if homogeneity cuts against mm -hmm. exploration, on the other hand, like greater diversity of options uh, points yeah. towards more exploration. Do you have a sense of where those might balance out? Is that just one of these tricky empirical <laughs> questions? I don't have a great instinct about where that nets out. I mean, I, I can think of certain... Certain algorithms, like in a multi-armed bandit context, there's this one that we haven't talked about yet called the least failures rule, which says you should always do the thing that has failed the fewest number of times. And this is asymptotically optimal, I think, if your discounting rate is nearly one, meaning if you're, you know, if you care about the far, far distant future, yeah. um, then this algorithm is reasonable. And partly what that means in a city where there's more restaurants than you could probably go to in your lifetime or the, the new ones are popping up faster than you could eat at them is... Try um, each thing once. <laughs> if you, and if you don't like it, don't go back. As soon as something lets you down, never go back. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that is reasonable. It's a kind of the Manhattan <laughs> lifestyle. Indeed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. 
guess you get with dating, or people talk about how that people tend to do that now. That there's so many options available potentially on these dating sites that uh, as soon as someone is mediocre in any respect, then you, uh, there's this temptation to dump them. Uh, yeah, there's, there's kind of ailing considerations there. I, yeah, it's the, it's this anxiety provoking thing where you know if you're interacting with someone in an asynchronous medium. Literally everything you say could terminate the interaction. <laughs> so I think this is part of why it is so kind of nerve wracking for people like using these sites. There was two uh, really uh, nice things that you uh, had in the exploration and exploitation chapter that I just wanted to mention. Uh, one is that it seems uh, people seem to get happier as they get older, uh, at least yeah. uh, after uh, 50 or 60, I think. Which would be potentially explained by this exploitation exploration trade off. Because yeah. uh, when you're young, uh, you're doing all of this exploration, but that comes at the cost of like present satisfaction because you're not always going to choose the option that you like the most now mm-hmm. uh, in the hope of it paying off in the future. And maybe it is actually paying off for people in the, f- in the future. Like, as they get older, then they like, then they get to reap the, the benefits of the exploration they did when they were young. I think that's exactly right. I think that's a really powerful idea. One of the people who has done a lot of really great research in this area is Laura Karstensen, who's at Stanford. And I think she's part of this movement to recharacterize what it means to be an older adult in society that, you know, we have a lot of negative preconceptions about um, getting old. You think of people as kind of set in their ways, resistant to change. There's research showing that older adults maintain fewer social connections as they go through life. And it can be tempting to read that as, oh, that's kind of lonely. In fact, there's this powerful way of reframing this, which is that older adults are in the exploit phase of their life. They are very deliberately pruning their social interactions to the people that really matter, uh, the people that bring them the greatest satisfaction. Um, They're doing what they know and love and, in fact, are essentially cashing in Mm. on a lifetime's explorations. You know, their past selves have eaten all of those mediocre meals in order to discover those incredible places that their later selves get get to really uh, enjoy. Mm. And so you should expect from this naturally that, in fact, contrary to, um, you know, stereotypes, older adults would be consistently happier than young people. And Mm. that's exactly what she finds. Yeah. Interestingly, I think uh, there's this middle-aged slump uh, in, in like at least the, the world as it is now that people are quite happy when they're 20. And I think it like goes down to a minimum at around 40 uh, and, then, and then goes back up. I'm not sure how you explain uh, the, the first thing, perhaps uh, families and children and uh, just, I don't know. Child rearing uh, may be a big part of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, a good question. Like, which is kind of another investment in potentially being happier when you're older. Yeah. I'll just give you uh, two obs- uh, not, not you, to the listeners uh, two observations and see if they can try to explain uh, explain the combination of them based on what we've talked about so far. So one is uh, Hollywood makes a lot more sequels than it used to. The other one is revenues from films are going down. So I'll give people just a, just a minute to think about those two and think uh, like why why would those two things happen? So the obvious explanation that a lot of people I've heard point to is that uh, people don't like sequels and that's why the revenues in the film industry are going down. So it's going from sequels to uh, the movie industry being in decline. But in fact, uh, what we've discussed uh, all through this episode gives us a very good reason to think that the causation goes the other way. That um, what's happening is because the film industry is in decline, perhaps because of competition from television or piracy or whatever else, this gives the film industry less reason to produce the um, blockbuster franchises of the future. So imagine you could produce, you know, uh, The Matrix 4 or something like that, kind of a, a reasonably sure bet, something that's definitely going to have a market. Or you could do the exploration of trying to create a new franchise, but probably failing because most franchises, in fact, fail. The latter is an investment in future returns on sequels that you'll make on this new potential franchise. But if the industry is in decline, you don't care about the long-term future as, as an industry that much anymore. So why take the risk now? Why pay now for a potential uh, payoff in like what is a shrinking pool of film goers? I just thought that was like beautiful. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. And I mean, I think the insight here is that um, in a finite horizon version of the multi arm bandit problem, if the horizon determines your strategy then someone observing your strategy should be able to infer the horizon. Um, And I think that's exactly what's going on in the film industry, where they are behaving like they are in exploitation mode, milking those cash cows Mm. while they can, and and not investing in the franchises that the next generation uh, will enjoy. And so that is a rational response to being at the end of your life cycle time. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are sick of the 17th Marvel superhero film, then I guess go to the cinema more and maybe they'll make something different <laughs> or like tell them you'll go to the, f- the cinema in the future and they'll make something different. Just calling back to the, to the question of whether people explore or exploit too much or which way they're biased. 
it seems to me like as a society, uh, we can't be too far off the optimum because if it was the case that people who explored much more were way more successful, then people would notice that and copy. Uh, and on the other hand, if people who uh, exploited a lot more, explored less, uh, were really more successful, then people would like just notice their lifestyle and copy it. Uh, I guess that, that depends on people being able to like see how successful other people are and how much they exploited versus exploited in life as a whole. But and then this isn't anywhere saying that we're going to be actually optimal. Uh, merely that uh, if we were egregiously wrong, uh, that like we might notice as a society. Uh, what do you think of that argument? That's interesting. I mean, I think partly there is kind of a a two level optimization happening where each person is you know, trying to have the best life that they can or, or, you know, get the most jackpots in life's casino, whatever that might mean for them. But you also have this kind of societal, ecological, evolutionary thing happening where societies in which uh, the ratio of exploration and exploitation are tuned appropriately for that environment are going to outcompete or outperform other societies that have a different makeup. So, mm-hmm. It may be the case that an individual person is kind of uh, shackled to whatever genetic inheritance they have of being a very risk-averse person or being a very risk-seeking person that may uh, limit their ability to adapt in, in a given environment. But they are also part of this kind of broader framework. So I don't, I don't have a clear sense of whether we ought to kind of draw from some of this that, you know, we're basically on the Pareto frontier of how good things can be. It doesn't subjectively feel that way, but I don't, I don't know. I have to think more about that and, and kind of see where that logic goes. Okay. Uh, I just want to do a bit of a section here. Like, the book just had so many like amazing little stories in it that, that really stuck with me that I kind of wanted to go through some of them just for the enjoyment of the audience. This isn't particularly building anywhere, unfortunately, but, but you can, you can exploit this, this section as you like. So what's, what's thrashing? I found this really fascinating. Uh, I've just yeah. never heard of this concept. Right. So thrashing is an idea that comes up in the context of computer scheduling. And in particular, it emerged during, I want to say the 1960s, uh, as they were developing kind of multi-user machines. So this idea that you have uh, different processes or different users on a given piece of hardware, essentially competing for the resources of that hardware. And as you switch from a particular user or a particular process to another you have to kind of reallocate the machine's resources. So effectively refill the RAM uh, with data relevant to the next task. And so there was this problem that people began noticing on these timeshare machines, which is that as you add more and more users or more and more tasks to the workload of a machine, uh, initially it seems like everything's fine. You know, you can accommodate uh, two or three processes in parallel and everyone's basically getting what they need. But beyond a certain point, it wasn't as if the performance degraded linearly. It was that you'd hit some threshold and then just spectacularly collapse the performance of the system. Um, and so this was really interesting to people at the time. No one really knew what was going on. Um, and it was really a researcher named Peter Denning who was able to diagnose this problem and he coins this term thrashing. So the basic idea in thrashing is that imagine your system is dividing its time in just sort of a round robin fashion between, you know, five different tasks, let's say. And at the beginning of that slice of time, it begins filling its RAM with data relevant to this new task. It's essentially kind of setting up its workspace, if you want to think about it that way. At the end of that task, it does a context switch out of that kind of workspace and you know, sa- saves its work, book- bookmarks its progress, and and moves on. Well, if you get to a point where the time slice that you've allocated to that particular process is just long enough to do that bookkeeping, then you can get into a position where the computer is doing basically 0% actual work. Mm-hmm. It is just context switching into the next task and then immediately context switching out. And so... This is one of the most frequent culprits for the spinning beach ball of doom uh, that that Mac users will be familiar with um, or the or the Windows equivalent that suddenly it's like, you know, you have 67 browser tabs open. Everything's fine. You open a 68th browser tab and then your whole system appears to lock up and it takes, you know, 60 seconds to even close them back down again. So that is usually a telltale sign of thrashing. And part of why I got so interested in thrashing was that it just felt like I could recognize some of my own, you know, 
worst moments. And I, I thought it was a reasonable diagnosis of certain periods of kind of psychic paralysis that I think most of us, certainly myself, encounter where if you have so much to do that you're spending all of your time reminding yourself what to do or prioritizing what to do or beginning something but then being reminded of something else and then starting that, um, you could find yourself in a position where you're effectively spending your entire time budget on this kind of meta work. Just switching attention and like trying to figure out what you should be paying attention to. Yeah. And then never actually doing anything having done that. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, I think one solution to this is just to do something from the list uh, and let the other things hang and don't think any more about prioritization. Just do it and then then move on to the second thing. Uh, like stop doing this meta work. It's not actually yeah. helping you. Uh, and then like once you've cleared some things off the list, uh, then maybe you'll be able to return to doing some prioritization. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so that the, the catchphrase that we use in the book is work dumber. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is an idea that has a lot of grounding in actual computer science practice. So, I mean, there's two ideas here that I think support this. One is that if you have a series of tasks, each of which is going to take a certain amount of time, you only have one machine to do them on, and you want to optimize for what's called the make span, which is the total amount of time it will take you to do everything. Well, it just so happens that the order doesn't matter at all, because mm. you simply have a certain finite amount of work, a certain amount of time. And so if you find yourself in a position where you're optimizing for the make span, so your goal is to reduce the total amount of time you spend working, and you can't delegate, it's just you going to do the work, and it's all more or less equally important than... The worst thing you can do is spend any time thinking about the prioritization. You should just begin total randomly. Yeah, yeah, it's a total waste of your your energy. And we there's an anecdote in the book that we tell about the Linux operating system. Every operating system has what's called a scheduler, which performs you know exactly this function for the CPU of how many microseconds to be working on this particular thread, when to switch, what to switch to, how to stack rank the different priorities that the system has, and how much time to give each of them. And in a sense, you can think of the this kind of meta process of doing the sorting and the prioritization as directly competing mm. against doing, doing the work. And so this is one of these cases where it turns out that the best solution might be to be more imprecise. And so we follow kind of the evolution of the Linux kernel in through the 2000s. And I, I want to say it was 2003. They replaced the scheduler which, with one that was less accurate about prioritizing the different tests on the system, but more than made up for it by just spending all of that time doing more stuff. Mm. And so I, I found that a very kind of consoling message. Okay, let's move on. The Copernican Principle and Laplace's Law. These I both uh, heard before, but uh, I think you did a really good exposition of them. So do you yeah, want to great. just briefly describe them? Yeah, I mean, the, the Copernican Principle is this idea that if you are trying to estimate the duration of something... So the example of, of how this actually came about was there was a guy who found himself at the Berlin Wall and was just musing about, I wonder how long the Berlin Wall is going to be standing. And I don't remember exactly how long it had been up at that point. Let's say it was 11 years or something. He starts thinking about it and he says, well, on average, I should expect that I've shown up smack in the middle of the duration of this phenomenon. And so I should just double the amount of time and assume it's going to last for 11 more years. And it's this very intuitive idea, but it turns out that this has full kind of mathematical legitimacy of this is the appropriate um, Bayesian prediction that you should make if you have what is called an uninformative prior, where not only do you not know how long something is going to last, but you don't even know the scale. Um, it could be equally likely to last for milliseconds as millennia, that you have one of these what are called scale-free priors. If you crunch the numbers, you get exactly this prediction that if you just happen upon something, you should assume that it's going to last exactly as long as it's lasted already, which I think is a really, really nice rule of thumb. And it's kind of nicely validated by the math. Uh, and I think it, I mean, it does actually work for some kind of prediction. So you got this uh, question of uh, trying to predict when a bus is going to arrive. 
if you know how long it's been since uh, the same bus on that line last left that station, then you say double that is how is like on average how long it will take for the next one to arrive. Yeah, I guess you got the United States has been around for uh, 100, 230, <laughs> 240 years, so may, on average it's got two hundred and forty years to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's another there's another case of this uh, the doomsday argument, which uh, says uh, you're as likely to be in the first half uh, of all of the humans that are ever born as the second half. Uh, so on average, you would expect there to be, on average, there should be as many uh, humans yet to be born as mm. have been born so far, uh, which uh, and if you have exponential growth in population, it suggests that uh, doom is coming very soon. Yeah, uh, There's a lot of like, debate about whether this argument actually goes through. And it's right. interesting there that there you're sampling from uh, humans uh, who existed rather than time. Maybe right. we think about it, like in which cases you should use time and in which cases you should use instances of the thing that you're describing yeah but. yeah that's that's an interesting point point. and then uh, laplace's law yeah so it was originally considered in the context of one of these kind of baroque lotteries where you know you're drawing lots out of a hat and you're trying to estimate what percentage of these uh you know s- colored slips of paper or whatever are one color versus another based on a certain number of samples that you've drawn so far and it turns out that the the best rule of thumb here is the let's say you're you're calculating what percentage of the slips of paper you've drawn are green out of the the total and the answer is just the number of green ones that you've drawn plus one over the total number of samples plus two Um, and this is just another one of these kind of wonderfully elegant results that comes out of thinking about this from a bayesian perspective if you have I think this requires you to have a uniform prior, so it may not always apply in every single situation, but it gives you just a really elegant rule of thumb that I think is applicable in a lot of cases. So I imagine that you were going skydiving and you're the first person ever to go skydiving and you go skydiving once uh, and then you survive. The question is like, uh, what fraction, like what should be your likelihood of dying on the, on the second run? Yeah. I guess in this case, it would say it's one out of two at most. Um, and then if you go again and you survive again, then it's um, one out of three and mm-hmm. uh, then so on, one out of four and on and on and on. There's this medical paper that I'll find and um, stick up a link to, which is uh, if nothing bad has ever happened, will everything be okay? Which uh, basically uses Laplace's <laughs> rule to figure out like how safe something is uh, when oh, you haven't seen a catastrophe so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's quite neat. There's an optimal stopping problem called the burglar problem that asks you basically how many heists should you go on if you have a certain fixed probability of getting arrested and having all of your assets seized. And it depends on your probability of succeeding. And you can do this really lovely proof using Laplace's law that says that if you are willing to burgle at all and you succeed, then if you use Laplace's law, you'll never stop. You'll be more inclined to burgle in the future, <laughs> etc. Yeah, exactly. And so every time you succeed, you become more confident in your ability to pull it off the next time. And so yeah. you never stop. And so you're guaranteed to eventually get arrested. And I guess uh, you have less and less value and more and more money. That might be an offsetting factor that would actually cause people to stop in the real world. So you're like stealing more and more. Yeah. Like you don't get linear returns. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. Money so maybe that would eventually cause you to stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that may be part of the answer why... It, Literally all criminals are not in jail. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, or are, like still still um, burgling houses at the age of 80. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think uh, the Laplace's law is also called the law of succession. I think if you uh, Google that, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia article comes up. Okay, another one. Uh, you've got a pro and con lists and kind of cancelling out. Mm, and yeah. uh, Darwin doing that, trying to decide whether to marry. And I yeah. think... Um, this was something that Benjamin Franklin did all the time. He'd write up these very extensive pro and con lists. Do you want yep. to describe what you talk about that? Yeah. So there's this really beautiful um, kind of charming passage from Charles Darwin's diary where he's trying to decide whether to propose to this woman. And he draws up this list of all of the things that might be good or bad. You know, he's children, if it, if it pleases God. Um, on the other hand, I'll have less money for books. I mean, it's really, really amusing all the things that he thinks about. And by the end, you know, smushed into the bottom margin of the page, he decides, marry, 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 QED. You know, it, it is proven. And he then goes on to, of course, overthink the decision of when to marry, now or soon. And then he lists all the pros and cons of he wants to go on this hot air balloon trip to Wales and all these different things. What I think is really interesting about that is this particular example of Darwin is often raised in this context of someone who is a chronic overthinker. Like it seems, you know, it seems in a way too calculating of a way to think about getting married. 
In some ways, I think you could make the opposite argument, which is that he forced himself to decide by the bottom of a single piece of paper. And it was as if he listed things until he just hit the bottom of the page and then forced himself to make a decision based on an evaluation of the factors that happen to fit into the page. And this is connected to this idea from machine learning, which is called regularization. The basic idea in regularization is that oftentimes it's possible to make an arbitrarily complex model of some data that you want to try to predict, let's say. But there might be a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do that. For example, there's this very deep idea in machine learning called the bias variance trade-off that says basically the more complex your model is, the more it will differ based on the exact data that you're fitting it to, and this will make it less robust to new data that it hasn't seen. And extrapolating from the model it makes may be more and more bizarre and random. So there are a lot of reasons to want to inhibit the complexity of a model, even if it's the case that a more complicated model appears to offer a better fit for the data that you have. It fits what you've already seen, but it won't fit the future. Exactly. Because it's fitting it's fitting itself to idiosyncratic factors about what you've seen so far, not, not the under, fundamental underlying process that generated what you saw. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so there has been this entire development of methods for regularization, L1, L2, etc., um, that you know, some of your listeners w- will be familiar with, um, that basically act as kind of a downward pressure on the number of variables or the number of parameters that your model has. And so I think it's interesting, on the one hand, to just make this argument for simplicity, that I think intuitively we have this idea that you know, making a better decision almost necessarily means taking more information into account, uh, thinking longer, gathering more data, considering more factors. That's not necessarily the story that you get by thinking about this from the perspective of machine learning. There are, I think, powerful arguments for simpler models um, being more robust in, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I kind of quite like pro and con lists in a way, or just like, yeah, trying to think of like a good number of uh, positive things and negative things about about a choice. Uh, and you're saying kind of you need to cut that off at some point because otherwise you just end up... Uh, thinking about things like unimportant things that you care about right now, but like won't seem that important in the future, something like that. Maybe just, uh, I think maybe an even bigger problem with really extensive pro and con lists is that there's this uh, strong temptation uh, to uh, decide based on which uh, side of the ledger has more factors on it, uh, which is obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah, incredibly yeah. stupid. Uh, yeah. and, like no one would think that they're deciding on that basis, but they could kind of do it by accident. The other thing is if you have very long lists of pros and cons, uh, it's hard to divide your attention to each of those uh, in, in accordance with their importance. And so, uh, if, yeah, if you have a, lo- a long list of factors where like the, the top one is should be given the hundredth the weight of the bottom one, uh, then you're not actually going to spend a hundred as hundred hundred times as uh, much time thinking about it. And like, you, it's very hard to just give it uh, that much uh, significance. And so I actually think like a pretty good procedure is to potentially spend quite a bit of time thinking of pros and cons. And then like pick the top three from each side, like really think about which of the top three and then just weigh those against one another rather than allowing yourself to become distracted by like insignificant issues further down the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think this is exactly the counter narrative that you can apply to the Darwin case. And you can say he was regularizing himself to the page. You know, he, he would only consider the number of factors that could fit onto a page of loose leaf paper um, or, or his diary notebook paper. And, uh, you know, I occasionally use this in my own life where I will think about something until, you know, I've completely run dry of things that I can say about one side or the other. Um, But then I will force myself to articulate the gist of the decision as on the one hand X, on the other hand Y. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And now granted, that's, that's a fairly artificial way to go about it. You know, if Y is half as important as X, but you know, Y prime also exists and is equally important, then you could get a decision that's sort of faulty. But I think this method of kind of aggressively constricting the complexity of your decision-making process, there's this, I think, a a story that you can tell that really makes this argument that robust decision-making, especially in the face of great uncertainty, really should be as simple as possible. There's this interesting ambiguity where it's not clear whether you should spend more time contemplating a decision in an environment uh, where evidence is very clear and crisp versus whether it, where it's vague and hard to say how much weight to give to it. There's kind of an elasticity there, uh, thinking as an economist, because there's, kind of, there's two different considerations. On the one hand, uh, where the evidence is very clear, like um, you can tell how strong an argument is. 
that means that kind of you got more value from finding out that argument because you know how good it is. On the other hand, you might actually just end up solving the problem fairly quickly. Hmm. You, you come up to a good answer fairly fast. On the other hand, with a question where it's like really hard to tell how strong the arguments are, it's like very like hard to predict the future, those kind of long-term things, or just like you don't understand the lay of the land very well. On the one hand, uh, the arguments you're coming up with just like aren't terribly persuasive. On the other hand, you really don't know what to do because uh, yeah. the question is so much harder and you're never going to be super confident. So yeah, it's... Uh, it's actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I wish I knew the answer to this, whether uh, like when you're making a very difficult decision under uncertainty, whether you should spend a lot of time thinking about it or, or like more time thinking about it or less. Yeah. I mean, the, the question of time is, is quite interesting. I mean, I certainly think if you, if you're framing it in terms of the complexity of the logic or the complexity of the model that you're building, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to write a business plan for the next 18 months it should probably be pretty long and include like, this is exactly what's going on in the market. This is exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to do it in X, Y, and Z. How, what is there our projections? If you're trying to make a business uh, or create a nonprofit organization that you want to have an impact a century from now, the business plan is probably going to be like two sentences, <laughs> if that. And, that. and that is appropriate, yeah. right? Because everything else is going to sort of wash out in the uncertainty of, mm-hmm. of what might happen. And so in a way, it's sort of counterintuitive that the the grandest ambitions in a way should be the most succinctly stated. But I think that makes sense from this perspective. Yeah. This is funny thing. If, if you try to figure out how to influence the world in a couple of years time, then you can come up with like very, yeah, very specific plans about well, I'm going to work at this organization and meet this person. Whereas if you're thinking about oh, how will I be able to have a lot of influence in 50 years time, it becomes very vague. Like I need to have a lot of money or I just need to be like mm. a, a well-known person uh, because you can't figure out who you need to talk to or what you need to spend the money on yet. Yeah. Okay. Let's push on. Uh, computational kindness. Uh, yeah. What is that concept? I loved it. Yeah. So with everything that we've been kind of establishing about the computational nature of the problems that people face in everyday life, it gives us an opportunity to think not just tactically and strategically, but also ethically about the problems that we pose to one another both in our kind of interpersonal interactions, but also in the types of policy that we enact and the way that we design physical environments and things like this. So uh, one example would be, imagine you're driving towards a destination. Uh, so you know, if, we, if we frame this as a math problem, it would be something like you're on an infinitely long, infinitely straight road, and you start infinitely far away from your destination and you're approaching your destination uh, and you're looking for a parking spot. You see a space appear, And then you are faced with this kind of optimal stopping problem of, do I just take this space or do I push on in the hopes that there's a better one out there? And it's kind of symmetric. You can continue going. Yeah. And then you can overshoot it and end up farther away on that side and so forth. Exactly. So there's actually a heuristic that says always overshoot it because then you are at most twice as far away as you Mm. would have been. More than 50% of the time you should overshoot. Right. And, And so part of what's interesting about this is that the strategy of approaching the destination requires this analysis of what is the percentage of the spots that are occupied. As soon as you pass the destination and you start pointing away from it, all of the math drops away and you should just take the first spot that appears. And I think, you know, you this is sort of a toy example, but if you imagined building a parking garage, if you start the parking garage at the best spots and you slowly spiral to worse and worse and worse spots. That's a computationally kind architecture because the optimal stopping rule is dead simple. If you see a spot, it's by definition the best spot that you've encountered so far. Take it, you're done. If you build the parking garage in the opposite direction where you enter, let's say, at the back and you're slowly spiraling towards the place where you want to go, then you find yourself now in this dilemma where you have to kind of crunch the numbers and figure it out. And so, I mean, it's just a small example, but it shows that the problems that we face are not, some of them are just intrinsically posed to us by nature, by the world. Uh, many of them, and increasingly many of them, are designed by somebody else. So I'll give maybe two, two examples here. Another toy example and then another sort of more real world example. So the toy example, um, there's this lovely paper by uh, the computer scientist Jeffrey Shallot looking at if you were to add a coin to the money supply, uh, let's say you wanted to minimize the number of coins required to make change across all possible, you know, values of change that you might need to make. What would be the denomination of the coin? Turns out it's 18 cents. Uh, it would be add an 18 cent coin. Unfortunately, this would 
dramatically alter the computational kindness of making change. So currently you can use what's called a greedy algorithm where if you're making change, you just give as many quarters as possible, then as many dimes as possible, then as many nickels and then as many pennies. If there was an 18 cent piece and you needed to give someone 36 cents, you wouldn't just start with the quarter than the dime. You would have to realize, oh, this is two 18 cent coins. Mm. So change making would cease having this greedy algorithm. Can you still follow the process of giving the biggest coin that doesn't take you over and then the next slightest coin until does that still? No, work? you can't. No, you no can't. and that's so, the so key, it becomes right? like a knapsack problem. Or exactly, something. exactly oh, right. Exactly. Interesting. Right. And why doesn't that happen when it's all like uh, you know divisible by ten or five or one? As long as everything is kind of mutually divisible, then oh, there's never a situation where gotcha. some combination of smaller things is better. So then you can ask the question, well, what denomination coin, if added to the money supply, would minimize the this expected number of coins per transaction subject to the condition that change making still has this nice greedy algorithm? And it turns out the answer is a two cent coin, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And so... More broadly, I think there are a lot of situations where we can adjust the way that problems are framed in what I would consider this computationally kind or ethical framework that tries to minimize the, the cognitive burden on the other person. So for you know a real world example of this, if you are buying a house, typically the way that buying a house works is what's called a first price auction. Um, so sealed bid first price auction. So you try to estimate how many other bidders you think there might be, and perhaps you don't even know. So you try to gather information that suggests how many other bidders there might be. And then you make a single bid and your objective is to win, but you want to win at the lowest possible price. And so, you know, we can give you the math. There's, there's all this game theory of what is the best bid to make relative to your, you know, private evaluation of the, the worth of that asset. It also factors in how many other competitors are, you know, also trying to get it. And you can run the numbers and you can come up with an optimal strategy. Well, it turns out that if you instead set it up as what's called a second price auction, where the person who writes the biggest number still wins, but they pay the amount of the second highest bid. Um, This is also known as a victory auction. So there are all these wonderful theorems that say that a victory auction will, uh, once you take into account people's kind of strategic adaptation to the new rules, um, it will end up with the same good going to the same person for the same amount of money and generate the same amount of revenue to the seller. But all of this strategic thinking that buyers have to do goes out the window. The optimal strategy in a victory auction is to just literally put down exactly what you think the asset is worth. In the some most sense, you'd be willing to pay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In some ways, it is as if the rules of the game are optimizing for you. Yeah. There's no further optimization to be done by thinking strategically. I guess I assume that houses usually aren't auctioned this way because they think they can manipulate people and get them to behave irrationally and bid more than they should. Uh, like if they were fully being strategic in this way and, and downgrading from what they think it's worth to what other people think it's worth. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a number of theorems that show what's called revenue equivalence. Mm. Um, there may be specific reasons that the housing market violates the assumptions that those theorems are based on. But you do see, for example, Google's ad auction was um, famously set up as a victory auction yeah. in part because they figured the computational kindness to their clients or the people, you know, the people placing those ads would in the long run make it easier to place ads and easier to you know, sort of maintain a long standing relationship with Google yeah. and that they would come out ahead. Well, people are running so many ads that they, and they don't know the market, they can't see it. So it'd be so confusing as an advertiser to on every ad have to set like, what is my yeah. maximum bid for an impression? Right. Right. And, and, yeah. right exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so that one, that one's really nice. And auction theory in general, people should check that out. Another example of computational kindness that really resonates with me is if you're trying to schedule with someone uh, rather than say, oh, I'm free anytime in the next month. Like what time would you like to meet? But it, you, We've all received an email like that, right? And you're yeah. like, oh, I don't want to look at like my calendar and try to figure out yep. the optimal time to meet in the next mm-hmm. month. So I'm just going to like answer this email later. It's like a bunch of work. Yeah. Uh, whereas if someone says, are you free 2 p.m. on Tuesday? <laughs> you're like, well, I can definitely check that very easily. Yes. Uh, you're not you're not demanding anything of them to like figure out when they want to meet. Yeah. Uh, so oddly enough, being like very specific uh, and like limiting their options in fact is like, it requires less computation in their head and they're much more likely to respond to you. So I never email anyone suggesting uh, let's talk or let's meet without giving a very specific time. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Tom and I experienced this firsthand in the process of researching the book. You know, we did, I think, something like 100 different interviews with various computer scientists and so forth. Um, and we found empirically 
that if we said, are you free at 1030 next Tuesday, we got a higher response rate than if we said, are you free in the next Anytime. three weeks? <laughs> right? <laughs> Will you ever be free? That's yeah. the easiest question to answer, but not useful. Yeah, exactly. So it just, it just so happens that framing the problem in a way that's easier to understand is better than giving the person the option. Okay, so so this one's not actually uh, in the book, but you were, you were talking about it uh, earlier. Corrupted back channeling. Right, so this is an idea that comes out of networking. So one of the issues in TCP IP is how do you create a robust communication channel over an unreliable medium? And so one of the ways that you do this is by having what are called acknowledgements, or X for short. So... Whenever you send an HTTP packet, uh, you get what's called an ACK packet back. And this turns out to be this critical aspect of the functioning of the internet that I think people don't quite appreciate. So for example, your maximum download speed is dependent on your upload speed and on your upload latency, because the person who's sending you that file requires you to be going, "Uh uh uh-huh, 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 in order to send at the maximum bandwidth. And so you sometimes get these paradoxical situations where the user experiences what they perceive to be a download problem, but it, the symptom is actually that something's clogged in the upload uh, upstream direction. So in the book, we talk about this uh, issue that's called buffer bloat, which mm-hmm. is has exactly this property. It also connects to the linguistics of human communication, because back channels are huge and kind of unappreciated or underappreciated aspect of human communication that basically the listener has this active role in shaping even what appears to be a soliloquy or or uh, a one direction communication. So there's been a lot of really interesting uh, linguistics research on the role of these back channels. And so one of my favorite is there's a study where you are telling a story to someone on, let's say, over the phone, but unbeknownst to you, their back channels to you are being corrupted, and they're being replaced with random back channels. So Either they're coming at random times, or they say, "Uh uh-huh, but you hear, oh, or vice versa. What they find is that this completely destroys your ability to tell a convincing story. And the message here is really, there is this unsung role of the upstream direction, these back channels that's present, not only in our computer networks, but also interpersonally. So I guess uh, the problem is you're using this back channeling to figure out whether to whether to give more detail or less detail and whether to speed up or slow down and and to like yeah build up a model of how much the other person knows and what they know about but if it's just all random then you just send it with this incredibly confusing person who like wants you to suddenly go fast and slow like even though they should be the other way around and they, they, exactly. they seem to know about something and they don't understand it exactly so yeah you find that you know a storyteller for example will you know, painfully repeat a section of the story as if you didn't get it, but then this makes the story much worse and so forth. Um, you know, they're trying to build a model of what you do and don't appear to know, but that model doesn't make sense. So the evidence that they're getting uh, just doesn't paint some consistent picture. So then they're working over time trying to understand you. And I think, you know, part of what I think is just kind of an interesting parallel is that, you know, from kind of the late 1970s through the last decade, you have this parallel discovery of the importance of the back channel, both in networking and also interpersonally. And those stories kind of complement and inform one another. Okay, let's talk now a little bit about your career as a writer and whether whether listeners should potentially become writers as well. Yeah, are you are you glad you became a writer? Uh, what, what, what would you advise people in general? It's uh, known to be like a fairly difficult thing to break into. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's f- fairly competitive. Yes. I mean, I guess for one thing, I should bracket everything that I say with, you know, survivorship bias. Yeah. The fact that you're asking me indicates... I shouldn't listen. That, yeah, indicates I'm I'm not from the, you know, mm-hmm. median of the distribution or whatever. So with that having been said, I mean, I, for me, it's it's a really satisfying profession. And it's something that I certainly would, on the one hand, recommend to anyone who wanted to get involved. I'm reminded of Robin Williams, I believe it was used to say that if anyone ever asked him whether they should become a comedian, he would say no. The reason being, it was a really hard life with a low probability of success. And if the person had any doubt, then he really should turn them away. And if they had no doubt, then his telling them not to enter the profession would have no effect. And so I, 
I, I'm tempted to just give the Robin Williams answer and leave it at that. But I, but I also think that, you know, for me, following this kind of upper confidence bound strategy of taking a swing at it is something that I certainly don't regret. And in particular, I guess the one thing that I often tell writers is there's a sense in which realistic aspirations are almost just as difficult as unrealistic aspirations. I mean, this is an idea that, for example, Tim Ferriss has talked about, that often people self-select and don't try the outrageous, ambitious things. And because no one's trying it, it's not as hard as you think. Everyone is competitive. Exactly. Everyone is clambering for the realistic thing. Mm. So I experienced this as an undergraduate in a very explicit way, which was um, at Brown University, there was this introduction to writing course, the the intro level writing workshop. And it was so over-enrolled that they just had a random lottery. And that's who got in. And so people would spend their entire undergraduate years trying to get into this intro class. The intermediate level workshops required a portfolio. You had to submit, you know, a, a selection of your work. And I, as an incoming freshman, like pretty much everybody, assumed that my work was nowhere near good enough to qualify me for that. But I had a peer advisor who was an upperclassman, and she said, look, I'm going to let you in a secret. Everybody thinks they're underqualified. And so fewer people apply than the number of spots they had, and (laughs) everyone everyone gets gets in. And so I, I really felt like I was able to you know, just kind of jumped the turnstiles and went straight into intermediate, uh, the intermediate workshop. And uh, it kind of went from there. And more importantly, I feel like that gave me kind of a principle that I find useful in a lot of situations. I mean, the same thing happened to me. Um, I went to graduate school for creative writing. I graduated with my MFA at the bottom of the recession, which is not an ideal time to be minted with a terminal degree in creative writing. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do. And at the same time where I had work getting turned down from these kind of obscure online publications that were going to pay me, you know, $10 for an essay or something like this, I was able to succeed at getting a book contract with Doubleday. Um, And it felt to me very analogous to what I had experienced as an undergrad, where the competition for what were perceived to be the next logical steps was so fierce but no one was just going for it in a way. I mean, I, that, that's hyperbole, but yeah. um, it was harder than I thought to climb the ladder and easier than I thought to, to just jump the queue. And, and so I think that's, a, for me, I think that's advice that actually applies to almost any situation. But certainly, I've, I've found it a few times in my writing career, but I encourage people to try to think about that. Also, if you apply uh, further up the ladder, um, there's kind of always a lot of randomness with these applications. So, like, even if they shouldn't give you the job, there's a chance that they will. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you can, like, kind of ride that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, do you think you're in a good position to have a large social impact? Or do you have to make a lot of compromises in what you write about? That's an interesting question. I think it's, for me as a book author, it's a very different position from being kind of a day-to-day journalist where you're expected to produce some quote of stories every day, every week, every month, that kind of thing. Um, so... I certainly experience great latitude in types of projects that I can take on and how long I can spend working on them. It's also the case that I think book writing relative to magazine writing, you have a lot more latitude at the sentence level because the draft that you're turning in is just too big for someone to micromanage your syntax on every single sentence. I've done very sparing amounts of magazine journalism over the years. I haven't done any of that in a long time, but when I have, I've bristled at the amount that my editors have sort of massaged the points that I was making across the individual piece at the book length. You're just, it's just too much for them to successfully do that. Um, To some extent you can say what you like. Yeah. And I, I, I think that also has affected my, the way that I read magazine articles versus books. When you're reading a magazine piece, there's a single person on the byline, but what has appeared in that piece has gone through a chain of editors, each of which has sort of put some kind of stamp on it. Um, When you're reading a book, it is coming much more unfiltered from the author themselves. And so for that reason, yeah, I'm I'm sort of biased towards books as a medium, both as a writer and as a reader. You also don't have the experience of having some idiot come in at the last minute and give an inaccurate title. Uh, I think it's a very common problem for journalists. I I have experienced that. I have many horror stories about exactly that. And then later people will interview you and ask you why you said X. And out of loyalty to the publication, you can't can't just say, say 
well, <laughs> so-and-so up the editorial chain said X. It's a devil's bargain. They're, they're, sometimes they're like, oh, we'll publish your work, uh, but we'll have to, we'll, we'll lie about what you said <laughs> in the title to like get more clicks. Yeah. And it's like, it's yeah. kind of sickening in a way. But yeah, I guess it's a fierce media environment. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you don't have to deal with this in books, uh, so that's, that's fortunate. Yeah, you have you, you have a considerably greater degree of control over there, although probably a lot less than people imagine over certain mm-hmm. things like the subtitle and the cover art and things like that. So, you know, it's not it's not without that element. But I certainly think it's a pretty unique position even within the nonfiction ecosystem mm-hmm. to be able to write books. And so I I I try to take that liberty very seriously. What books uh would you like to see written on really important topics uh, that you don't expect to get to yourself and maybe that you do expect to get to yourself? Yeah. Well, I can't reveal my, you know, my R and D pipeline, (laughs) Um, but uh, no, I think that's a great question. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about is there just seems to be a near total breakdown in the ability of people to constructively disagree. I mean, by any measure, it seems like polarization is sharper than ever. Both, I mean, even if you just look at the left and the right politically in America right now, um, there's just a total uh, inability to speak to one another in a constructive way. And I think it's also reflected in just a society that is more self-segregating. It really seems to me that some sort of intervention needs to be done in order to restore people's ability to articulate what they think and why, and to have that conversation in a way that like, both people are gaining information, um, and it's not sort of framed as zero-sum mortal combat. I think that's important both for the politics of having a healthy democracy. I think it's also important for people just interpersonally to be able to like say vulnerable, difficult things and you know manage conflict or manage disagreement within a relationship. I, it feels to me like we're just getting systematically worse at that. I don't know if this is just me in my 30s becoming like curmudgeonly and you know saying kids these days but it, I think it the does seem to me things. yeah i agree with that it does seem well, to also me i think um people's real life relationships i don't think necessarily have gotten worse the relationships you have with your friends and family and how rancorous those discussions are wouldn't surprise me if that's pretty similar i think it's just that so much uh, interaction is now happening through other media that don't encourage uh, treating other people humanely yeah i think that's true i mean it also feels to me and I mean, this, it's hard, hard to measure this, but it feels like there are less constructive disagreements over the Thanksgiving table. Mm. I could be wrong about that. So I think there's something there that's sort of at the intersection of humility and actual kind of verbal skill that feels to me like a necessary intervention. Yeah, I have quite a lot of thoughts on this. There's a a, a common argument that people make that uh, it seems harmful to uh, think that other people uh, either have stupid ideas or that they're evil. Mm -hmm. Um, This is like bad when lots of people in society think this about other people in society. And so they're like, don't do it. I'm like, but you can't just change your beliefs based on like what you think is like most convenient for people to believe, right? If you really believe that, so you can change your behavior, Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't necessarily just say, oh, well, it would be bad if I believe that they were bad people. So I'm not going to believe that. I think like realistically what you can push on is say, yeah, lots of people are actually pretty bad. Lots of people have very stupid ideas, uh, but like it's not really helping to like treat uh, treat them uh, in a very angry, acrimonious way. Uh, So you should like find some way to make peace with being friendly potentially to people who you think are quite bad. Mm -hmm. Just like have some kind of fatalistic sense of humor, perhaps that all all realize that um, I think people often are inclined to say, well, they're a bad person. So I ought to like hate them or I ought to treat them badly. And I'm like, well, not necessarily, not if it doesn't help. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. What, like what, what ought is there if in fact all you're doing is uh, causing harm and not changing their minds? So yeah. I mean, I find just anecdotally, if I interact with people with whom I disagree, you know, th- their claws come out mm-hmm. automatically. And when I don't engage the conversation at the level of zero sum, one of us is going to win, but I just genuinely like attempt to understand what they're thinking and where they're coming from. I experience this reaction of almost confusion of like people don't know how to navigate this weird rhetorical context they now find themselves in. Like they're prepared to fight and when I don't fight back, then they, it's this weird thing where, you know, yeah. they're sort of trying to figure out what does it mean to have a different kind of conversation? The incentives are very different when there's an external audience versus if there's I not, agree with that. Uh, it's hugely different. Like if, if I'm just speaking to you, no one else is seeing and I'm trying to persuade you, then it's pretty clear that I should be nice to you. Uh, if there's like a hundred people watching and basically I don't care what you end up thinking, I just care about what they end up thinking. 
then uh, there's like potentially reason to like savage you in the conversation, even if I'm totally yeah. then giving up on ever convincing you. So yeah. yeah, like I think we probably need more conversations with our audiences, frankly. I agree. And, and it's not clear how that's going to happen because it feels like there sort of is no private sphere anymore. Mm. Right. Like well, anything a a you text to someone can be screenshotted oh, and yeah. on the front page of Reddit 30 seconds later, you know? Um, yeah. And so I feel like people increasingly behave in private as, as if, if they're in public. Yeah. I think it's very anxiety inducing as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to say here. Maybe we'll have like yeah. another episode on yeah, online discourse. So. Yeah. Well, it should be, it should be multiple books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I prompt. Think yeah. I th- think there is a stigma, like people who screenshot or like share private text messages publicly, I think are treated as like dishonorable uh, mm-hmm. and thank God mm-hmm. and thank God. Cause otherwise it would just, you would just constantly be having people uh, revealing like things that you, uh, yeah. I mean, it would make it impossible, I guess, to have like discourse via text message because it would be right. too dangerous. Um, right. Because I mean, all of us like have private views that we want to share with one person that we don't want published. Uh, there's nothing, nothing bad about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been in situations where, you know, I'm asked to address a group of, you know, 10 people and then someone says as if offhandedly, oh, can we record this and put it on YouTube? I'm like, no. Well, no, that's, that's a room of a million people. Yeah. That's, that's a completely different room. And Forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Recording. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I've been asked that before and I'm like, I say, yes, you can, but it'll be a totally different talk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like exactly. I have to change what I say. It's pretty, pretty substantially potentially. Yeah. You have to like think, oh, in that case, what if someone like took 10 seconds of what you said totally out of context? Then like, yeah, how bad could they make you seem? Yeah. You have to then be like constantly on the defensive about like anything, like any individual sentence that you might say. There's a good reason not to record things. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. It's as, it's as we say with a microphone in front, of, in front of both of us. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But I do think, yeah, we need to somehow try to reclaim that. So uh, it yeah, seems to me worth space. doing. All right. So to finish, um, you mentioned earlier that you're getting married in just a couple of weeks and marriage is something that shows up in the algorithms book uh, right. very regularly. <laughs> Did you end up using any of the algorithms that you described to decide whether to get married and when? Yeah. Um, my fiance tells this story, which I don't, I don't remember having said, but uh, I, I believe her when she says it, that uh, at some point after we were dating, I was researching the book, I was writing the optimal stopping chapter. And I mentioned to her, oh, you know, well, 37% of the average American male lifespan is something like 29. And I'm 29. So you know, if this works out, I'm all in. (laughs) Um, And I have no memory of this conversation. But that sounds like the kind of thing I would say. And, and it did work out. And I am all in. So yeah, you know, I, I followed that. So yeah, this has been an absolute uh, marathon conversation. We've covered uh, quite yeah. a lot of stuff from the book, though really uh, only three chapters out of 11 uh, in, in any detail. Uh, so, if you, so if you enjoyed this, there's, there's tons more in Algorithms to Live By. Um, there's also The Most Human Human and, and the book you're writing about uh, AI and uh, controlling it and where technology is going uh, coming out next year. So go out and buy these books. My guest today has been uh, Brian Christian. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours Podcast, Brian. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, just to finish, another quick reminder about the annual impact survey. If the show uh, or our coaching or any of the articles that we've put out over the last seven years that we've been at this have helped you have more social impact or changed your career or life in some other way, then please do head to 80,000hours.org slash survey and take a few minutes to let me and the rest of the team know about it. We really couldn't exist without you telling us your stories. Also, did you know that we have a newsletter which you can use to stay on top of all of the research that we release and also all of the new jobs that we recommend that people apply to on our job board? You can sign up for that at 80,000hours.org slash newsletter and never miss a thing. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.